Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Investment will come to order. Welcome everyone. I note that a quorum is present. I note for the subcommittee that Mr. Keller of Pennsylvania and Mr. Fitzgerald of Wisconsin are permitted to participate in today's hearing with the understanding that their questions will come only after all members of the subcommittee on both sides of the aisle who are present have had an opportunity to question the witnesses. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on policies and priorities of the Office of Federal Student Aid. This is an entirely remote hearing. All microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. I also ask that members please identify themselves before they speak. Members should keep their cameras on while in the proceeding. Members shall be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera, and they shall be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this if they are experiencing technical difficulty and inform committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulty during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair experience technical difficulty or need to step away to vote on the floor, Representative Bonamici or another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in the chair's absence. This is an entirely remote hearing and as such, the committee's hearing room is officially closed. Members who choose to sit with their individual devices in the hearing room must wear headphones to avoid feedback, echoes, and distortion resulting from more than one person on the software platform sitting in the same room. Members are also expected to adhere to social distancing and safe health care guidelines, including the use of masks, hand sanitizers, and wiping down their areas both before and after their presence in the hearing room. In order to ensure that the committee's five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time using the committee's field timer. The field timer will appear in its own thumbnail picture and will be named 001 timer. There will be no one minute remaining warning. The field timer will show a blinking light when time is up. Members and witnesses are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. Pursuant to committee rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses, in this case, a witness sooner, and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today, we meet to discuss the Office of Federal Student Aid Work to support and protect student borrowers. Mr. Cordray, Welcome to the Committee on Education and Labor and your first hearing before Congress in your role as FSA's Chief Operating Office. We are honored to have you here this morning. Under your leadership, FSA manages federal financial aid programs, including Pell Grants, Campus Bay Aid, and federal student loans. This is a tremendous responsibility as there are 43 million federal student loan borrowers who owe more than $1.5 trillion. Alarmingly, under Secretary DeVos and President Trump, 
the department abandoned its responsibility to American students and taxpayers, including by withholding debt relief from hundreds of thousands of students who were defrauded by low quality institutions, allowing predatory institutions to collect millions of dollars from taxpayers, shielding student loan servicing companies from regulatory agencies and state law enforcement and failing to ensure borrowers receive accurate information about critical programs such as the public student loan forgiveness program that are designed to support student borrowers and their families. So I am grateful that we now have an education department that is listening to student borrowers and working diligently to better support them. I recently heard from a constituent who is a teacher with nearly $100,000 in outstanding student loan debt. His loan balance has ballooned because the monthly payments that he can afford to make have failed to keep pace with the interest on his loan. This experience is not unique, which is why I applaud the transformative actions that the Department of Education has taken under your leadership and the leadership of Secretary Cardona to provide hundreds of thousands of student borrowers with the loan relief they were legally entitled to receive. And I look forward to the outcome of the department's ongoing negotiated rulemaking process, which will hopefully provide further relief to low-income borrowers and others and others and streamline the loan repayment process. In August, the administration took action to discharge the loans of 364,000 borrowers who have a total and permanent disability. The department also made important changes to streamline and automate relief for eligible borrowers in the future and ensure that their loans are not mistakenly, mistakenly reinstated. The Biden administration has also approved student loan relief for 92,000 student borrowers who were defrauded by their institutions and secured relief for an additional 115,000 federal student borrowers who were left stranded by the sudden collapse of ITT Technical Institute. And most recently, the administration announced major changes to the public service loan forgiveness program, both through a time limited waiver and the rule making process to keep our promise to nurses, teachers, first responders and other public service workers. Many public servants across the country have already been notified that help is on the way. In total, the Biden-Harris administration has erased $9.5 billion in loans for 563,000 borrowers. In many cases, the relief provided as help give borrowers and their families a second chance to a better life. I also applaud the steps that the department has taken to protect students and taxpayers from low quality institutions, including reinstating the FSA's enforcement unit, which was dormant under Secretary DeVos. While the department's progress has been encouraging, FSA is facing a series of major hurdles that are on the horizon. The upcoming return of loan repayment presents a monumental task for FSA 
and student loan services. We must ensure that students receive the education and support they need to begin repaying. They're gonna need a lot of support to transition. Many borrowers may be unsure of their rights and responsibilities and are experiencing continued financial hardship caused by this looming pandemic that may entitle them to change their repayment plans. We have to monitor this very carefully. Loan serving companies need a robust and well-trained workforce to support an increased volume of borrower request as repayment begins. And finally, while the shift to next the shift to next gen is a major opportunity to make long needed reforms to student loan servicing, the continuous delays under the Trump administration have left FSA with no margin for error. This hearing is a chance to learn about FSA's plans to address these critical issues, how they are balancing various priorities and what is being done to ensure that low-income borrowers and others at risk groups receive the appropriate attention from their loan services and FSA. Black students are the most impacted by student loans. I look forward to our discussion and the work you have ahead to ensure that all students, all students in this country can access high quality, higher education without taking on debt they cannot repay or falling victim to predatory institutions. Thank you again, Mr. Cadre, for being with us today and for your work to secure relief for student borrowers. We applaud you. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for the response of making an opening statement. Welcome, Dr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much for those opening comments. Uh, I, before I get my statement, I, I, I appreciate the complexity with, of this issue. We have so many people that don't understand um, that signing on a dotted line means that they have to pay money back. Also, we have uh, understanding, unfortunately, that so many of our institutions of higher education have not been um, bastions of uh, uh, financial prudence, and uh, therefore those financial burdens are laid upon those students. So it's really a multifactorial problem. We need to get on our institutions to cut back costs so that students have, do not have their, their futures uh, forsaken. So I appreciate the comments. So, you know, the Office of Federal Student Aid is an important agency that is responsible for over the, overseeing the disbursement of over 100 billion in grants, loans, and student aid dollars each year. Through such aid, millions of students are able to pursue post-secondary post education who would otherwise not have the means to do so. And that's a very, very just cause. In addition to this vital function FSA plays in higher education, FSA is also tasked with overseeing one of the greatest challenges that the Department of Education has faced since its inception, returning nearly 45 million borrowers into repayment status after nearly two-year hiatus in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The stakes could not be higher as the consequence of a failed transition would be catastrophic as millions of borrowers, those who signed on the dotted line, could needlessly default on their loans, thus ruining their own financial future. This should be the sole focus of FSA, but unfortunately, this office has bowed somewhat to partisan politics and put the wishes of a Democratic Party progressive base over the immediate needs of those students who they serve. Instead of working with its partners to ensure the transition to repayment runs smoothly, FSA is taken to an us versus them approach, treating these contractors more like adversaries than the critical partners that they really are. 
It's not a stretch to assume that such rhetoric from the highest levels of FSA contributed to the exit of several federal student loan services over the last year who have collectively served 16.5 million borrowers. Further, FSA is currently carrying out the implementation of the FAFSA Simplification and the Future Act. Instead of focusing on their implementation, which is critical to the disbursement of federal student aid dollars, FSA has decided to spend its energy harping on for-profit colleges through the revival of an Obama-era enforcement unit, while turning a blind eye to the misdeeds of institutions that serve the vast majority of students. To make matters worse, the Biden administration is using a permanent pandemic narrative to expand its takeover of higher education, recently announcing an executive action to overhaul the public, ser public service loan forgiveness program in direct conflict with the law Democrats unilaterally wrote. This will undoubtedly take away necessary resources that should be allocated to the soon to be disaster in the federal student loan program. In addition to the massive overreach of executive authority, this policy is fundamentally unjust. It puts taxpayers, the majority of whom do not own a college degree, on the, book, on the hook for billions of dollars in student loans borrowed by individuals making more than those taxpayers. This is one of the top 10 billion tax, this is on top of the uh, $100 billion taxpayers are already responsible for due to the continuation of the student loan repayment pause. Given FC, FSA has decided to spend its given on its, on its uh, on pleasing progressive advocates, it's usurping Cordray's team to pushing others to do F FCA, FSA's job, including telling states to regulate federal student loan services. FSA's lack of leadership will ultimately hurt the very students it claims to care about. For these reasons, I'm glad Chairwoman has uh, called this hearing today. Committee Republicans have requested information regarding all of these critical issues, but unfortunately, we received little or no response with the exception of an 11th hour letter that sadly did not address our questions, as I would expect should be and should be the case. Unfortunately, we have, uh, but fortunately rather, we have Chief Operating Officer Cordray here today to provide these answers for us, and I look forward to hearing more details on all of these issues. Thank you, Madam Chairman. With that, I will yield back. Our witness. Mr. Richard Corday is the Chief Operating Officer, COO of Federal Student Aid, FSA. Prior to his role, Mr. Corday served for six years as the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB. Before joining CFPB, Mr. Corday served as a Ohio's Attorney General and also served as Ohio Treasurer and Ohio State Representative and Ohio Solicitor General. Welcome. We appreciate, we will now hear from our uh, witness today. All right, thank you, Chair Wilson, Ranking Member Murphy and members of the subcommittee. I, we, we appreciate you for participating today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind you that we have read your written statements and it will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 8D and committee practice, you were asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. Despite your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and a light will blink when time is up. Please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. If you experience technical difficulty during your testimony or later in the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided to you in advance. After your presentation, we will move to member questions. When answering questions, please remember to unmute your microphone. The witness is aware of his, 
a responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee and therefore we will proceed with his testimony. And now welcome Mr. Cordray. <laughs> I, thank you, Chair Wilson. I think I jumped the gun there a moment. Ranking Member Murphy, members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify today about federal student aid's priorities. And though I'm no stranger to testifying before Congress, this is my first occasion in my new position. Right now at FSA, we face great challenges as we seek to provide the quality service that students, borrowers, and families deserve. Everyone has felt the effects of COVID-19, which has produced a notable downturn in both FAFSA completion and enrollment rates. This should be of great concern to all of us who wanna see our country achieve its full potential for generations to come. Our top priority every year is to ensure that students and their families have reliable uninterrupted access to the financial help they need. The FAFSA form itself is facing huge changes as we implement two new laws you passed to improve the student aid process. The changes you legislated will make it easier to complete the FAFSA form, unlocking aid for many more Americans. The operational challenges are extensive and we're being deliberate and strategic in planning to implement them. We're also working to reform the FAFSA verification process to reduce the burden on eligible students and their families, helping them secure a financial aid while protecting taxpayers. FSA is also charged with serving students across the full life cycle of student aid. As you know, many millions of borrowers already are in repayment and we're making changes to better serve them. For example, the Department of Education recently announced dramatic changes to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program that FAFSA will now carry out. We intend finally to fulfill the program's promise to secure loan relief for service members, teachers, nurses, police, firefighters, and others who've chosen to put community over self. We're also reviewing and improving other special forgiveness programs such as total and permanent disability. The department is considering ways to improve these programs through the ongoing negotiated rulemaking process, and we're collaborating with other federal agencies by leveraging data matching to streamline or automate loan forgiveness. In addition, to better meet the needs of everyone who owes money on their student loans, we just successfully secured contract extensions for the loan servicers who will continue to work with us over the next two years. This is a milestone because for the first time, we've secured new performance and accountability metrics that require servicers to put borrowers ahead of their own bottom lines, including penalties to make sure they do so. We look forward to working with those servicers that stepped up and grasped the shared vision of our responsibilities here. We will also improve transparency by expanding required data reporting. And let me say here that it was not I, but our negotiating team that did great work to secure these key changes that benefit borrowers with no per account price increase for taxpayers. To ensure accountability, FSA has created an Office of Enforcement to boost oversight of schools and reduce risks for students and taxpayers. To do this, we will work closely with our colleagues in the department, with federal partners such as the FTC, CFPB, Justice Department and Treasury, and with our state partners as well. We will also listen and learn from the community groups who advocate for students and borrowers. These relationships will help us achieve the goals that you and the Congress have set for us. Above and beyond all this work, however, looms an overriding challenge unique to the coming year, the unprecedented task of returning tens of millions of student loan borrowers back into repayment after a pause that was extended multiple times over almost two years. During this time, borrowers generally have not been required to make regular payments, have been subject to 0% interest, and if in default had collections stopped on their outstanding loan balances. In August, the department announced a final extension of these pandemic relief measures until January 31st, 2022. We know this will not be an easy transition for borrowers, our loan servicing partners, or any of the other stakeholders involved in the repayment process. This is a defining moment for FSA, and it's crucially important for millions of Americans that we succeed. We're working to execute a comprehensive plan to combine elements of borrower outreach, servicer hire train, hiring training and preparation, policy enhancements and oversight to help borrowers effectively manage the process of returning to repayment. The core of our plan is clear communication, quality customer service and targeted support for those having trouble making their payments. We and our servicers are engaged in informing borrowers about this deadline and what is expected of them. We ask you to help us spread the word so nobody is surprised or unprepared. We wanna be sure borrowers know their options, such as applying for an income-driven repayment plan to make their monthly payments more affordable. We also encourage borrowers to sign up for our auto debit program, which is the easiest way to make their current monthly payments. There's nothing abstract about the challenges we face. If we're to succeed as a nation, 
We must answer the call for the millions of Americans who depend on federal student aid as a path forward to better their lives. As each borrower succeeds, we all succeed. This idea is ingrained in the mission of FSA, which at its core is to enable the American dream. We appreciate your help and support as we move forward together to this end. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Madam Chair, you are muted. Thank you, Mr. Cordray. Thank you for your testimony. Under Committee Rule 9A, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. I will be recognizing subcommittee members in seniority order. Again, to ensure that the members five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time and the timer will show a blinking light when time has expired. Please, please be attentive to the time. Wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. As chair, I now recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Cordray, I applaud the actions taken to restore faith in the public service loan. However, for many borrowers, 10 years is too long and they can't uh, wait that long for relief. What would be the impact of providing forgiveness on a tiered basis for example, by allowing borrowers to have a portion of that debt erased for every year of qualifying service. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the question. Uh, and uh, let me start by saying that, uh, of course, Congress passed the law that provides for a 10 year time frame, and Congress could change that time frame if Congress sees fit. It wouldn't be for me uh, to change that time frame. Uh, although we'd be happy to provide uh, technical assistance and input into what the operational effects of that might be. Uh, we are working to implement uh, the changes that are being made uh, in the program currently, important dramatic changes that are gonna benefit, as we say, all the people who deserve public service loan forgiveness but haven't had it in the past. Those are service members, police officers, firefighters, you know, people who have really stepped up during the pandemic and put themselves at risk for the benefit of the rest of us. And so whatever changes you might wanna make in that program, we'll be happy to work with you to understand what they are and give you uh, whatever input we can to be of help to you. Thank you, I'm drafting a bill to address that. So you should, uh, we'll, we'll uh, elicit your help in finishing that product. Also, can you explain to us what is Operation for Fresh Start? So I don't know that there's a specific operation fresh start. There are policy uh, matters under consideration uh, uh, at, at the department uh, as to what uh, the uh, effect of the repayment restart that's happening after January 31st, 2022 will be on defaulted borrowers. Uh, uh, it is understood that delinquent borrowers will be returned to current status. Uh, and we'll move forward to try to put them in the right position to succeed uh, in returning to repayment. As for defaulted borrowers, those are matters that are under consideration right now. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have more for you on that at this point. Thank you. Studies have shown that disparities in student loan debt are deeply rooted in racial wealth disparities. What are FSA's plan for addressing racial and social economic disparities in student loan default and, ne and um, negative amortization? So in general, you know, we're looking and, and looking carefully at how we can improve uh, the repayment programs here. As you mentioned at the outset, there's more than 40 million Americans who owe money on student loans. When you think about 40 million Americans and their families, we're getting to half the population of this country. So it's a major, major uh, issue. As you say correctly, uh, the number of people who are in default on their loans or people who are having trouble repaying their loans, there is some racial inequity in those numbers, we believe. Uh, however, what we want to do here is to administer this program fairly, uh, which ultimately will benefit taxpayers because what can be repaid will be repaid. Uh, and what is more difficult, uh, there are programs for that, such as income-driven repayment, 
uh, and other, other programs that borrowers should get signed up for. And we're working hard with our servicers to make sure that borrowers know those options and that servicers make it as easy as possible for people to access those options. And we made some changes at the department to accomplish that as well. Uh, but we're, we're keenly aware of what you say about the differential effect of this on, on American uh, uh, people. Uh, and we wanna make sure that the program works as well as it can. And we think there's lots of room for improvement here. Okay, reportedly President Biden has asked to prepare you to prepare a memo on the president's legal authority to forgive student loan debt. What is the uh, status of that memo? And uh, once finalized, will it be made public? So I think it's widely known that there have been legal memos prepared across the government and that the White House has been taking them under consideration. Uh, and that's a matter for the White House to determine, obviously not for me. Whatever is determined, we will implement it. I do think that uh, student loan forgiveness helps many worthy uh, borrowers help get back on their feet, uh, but we will see what happens and whatever it is, we will implement it as best we can and as smoothly as possible for borrowers and taxpayers. Do you know when that will be made public? Or is there, do you have any timelines from the White House? I, I do not. Okay, Madam thank Chair. you so much, thank you. And now I will yield to our ranking member for his questions, Dr. Murphy of North Carolina. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll just turn up my volume here. Um, thank you for the insightful questions uh, that you had. Let me, uh, Mr. Caudry, appreciate your, uh, your coming on today. Let me just uh, run a couple things by you. As you're aware, through the CARES Act and the executive action, student loan buyers, uh, borrowers rather, received significant relief since March of 2020. Um, it was a significant relief and a, and a very bipartisan act of Congress. But in addition to the payment pause, borrowers seeking forgiveness under PSLF uh, have moved nearly two years closer to forgiveness because such payments have been counted towards a requirement. This was a significant benefit for these borrowers. Would you agree? Yes, I believe it is. Right. I, I mean, I do, too. I think it's a major benefit for those borrowers. Is it reasonable then to argue that particularly with respect to those who did not suffer joblessness, such borrowers are in a better position financially in relation to their federal student loans than they were prior to the uh, pandemic? Would you agree with that? I think it's very hard to say uh, on that question, just because the pandemic has affected many public service employees. There are a lot of jobs that have been cut or people have had their hours cut back because of the budget problems that we all experienced early in the, in the days of the pandemic. Congress provided significant relief that I think helped state and local governments and, and the federal government in various respects. Uh, and that has staunched some of the damage. But yeah. in terms of whether borrowers are in a better position today than they were before the pandemic, that's gonna vary dramatically from one community to another and one sure. household to another. Sure. I, I, I would not disagree. I would just submit, however, that the vast majority of individuals who still stayed employed did not have their hours cut back and they're in a better position. So the reason I ask these questions is because the department has recently announced a major overhaul of the PSLF program using authority provided to the secondary secretary under the HEROES Act of 2003. And so under this authority, the secretary may waive or modify any statutory or regulatory provision applicable to the student financial assistance programs under Title IV of the HEA to ensure that recipients of student financial assistance under Title IV of the Act who are affected individuals, which are those who suffered direct economic hardship as a result of a military operation or national emergency, but are not placed in a worse position financially in relation to that financial assistance uh, because of their status. Is, is that correct? Is your understanding what that, uh, what that statement says? It's my understanding that the HEROES Act, which was passed, of course, by Congress, uh, does give the secretary substantial authority here. Uh, and that was exercised as, as well as other authorities that are granted uh, to, uh, to effectuate this uh, relief on the, on the public service loan forgiveness program. Yes. Okay, so we, we agree that there's heterogeneity in what all of uh, all our programs and all the, that, that our borrowers are facing and that a one size fits all uh, approach is probably not the actually correct approach. Would you agree? 
You know, I, I think that's a broad statement. I would like to know specific instances. I think sometimes a broad approach is simplest to implement, but sometimes a nuanced approach is much more congruent to the situations of individual families and, and households and communities. So yeah. I'd say it, it depends. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'll just take a point of order here. My clock seems to have frozen and I don't want to take off my time. I'm, we're all frozen in time here. So um, well, I gave you a lot of time. Well, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to talk for the sake of talking. I just want to abide by the rules. So let me go on just to another question. Mr. Cordray, President Biden has made it clear that forgiving student debt is a top priority for his administration and stated on multiple occasions he would sign a bill for giving $10,000 in student debt for all borrowers if Congress wants sent to his desk. Do you support this policy? Has anyone in the Department of Education asked you or your team to process to forgive $10,000 or some amount for all borrowers? Or, or are there other forgiveness plans that you have undertaken a part of the process? So just to, just to reset my position here, that's a policy decision. Uh, I have an operational job. My job is to take whatever policies are adopted, whether by Congress, of course, in the first instance through statute or the department through regulatory authority or authority given by Congress and make sure that's carried out effectively. Uh, we have our hands full to do that job uh, with, uh, with all the various things falling on us right now, including return to repayment, as you noted at the outset, sure. is a major, major challenge. Sure. Uh, so I would just, I would defer on the question of what right. is my so, personal but, preference here. All right, so you don't have a personal preference. And so if the president said everybody gets $10,000 off, you just do your job and implement it, correct? I think if that were the decision, it would benefit many, many borrowers who are otherwise in trouble, some of whom never finished college, so never got the benefit of the bargain there. Uh, and so I can understand why that would be considered important, and I and I we will see what happens, but it is not my decision to make. I just wanted to caution on that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I say to those individuals who didn't finish college that that was a risk that they took, and they're still, just because they didn't finish college doesn't mean they didn't have their risk. I just... Uh, this blanket forgiveness stuff for especially being paid by people who never, who never even went to college, um, I think is exceedingly unfair. So let me just ask you a, a quick question. Do you have an estimate by any chance if we did implement this uh, uh, $10,000 per borrower um, forgiveness, what it would cost the, the taxpayers of the country? Uh, I do not. I'm sure people are preparing various estimates of that, but uh, my job is to implement uh, the law and the policy as it's established. That is not yet a policy that's been established. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll wait and see on that. Yeah. So uh, from my understanding, the estimates are about $373 billion. You know, the nation goes further and further in debt these days. And so um, just problematic. I want people to get out to work and not be, uh, not be overrun by, bet by debt. But there's also a part about personal responsibility that when you sign on the dotted line, you know what you're putting forth. There's also responsibility from our institutions to, uh, not ruin our citizens. So I'm over my time. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member Dr. Murphy. Uh, Ms. Jalapal, our a progressive champion, welcome. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. And thank you so much, Mr. Cordray, for everything you've been doing and everything I know that you're going to do. Federal student aid is intended to enrich underserved students but sadly, for-profit colleges have been more interested in using these funds to pad their pockets in exchange for student loan debt and unusable degrees. 63% of low-income graduates from these institutions will never earn enough in their lifetime to be better off than a high school graduate. However, by simply enforcing existing laws to hold for-profits accountable and make them ineligible for federal student aid, students and taxpayers won't have to endure these enormous costs. The proliferation of predatory for-profits can be traced back to their ease of access to federal student aid. I'm gonna be reintroducing my bill, the Students Not Profits Act, to stop for-profits from abusing these funds. But the Department of Education already has broad authority to act on its own. Provisional program participation agreements are temporary certifications, as you know, that FSA gives to schools to work towards meeting federal student aid standards. Predatory colleges are not entitled to student aid, therefore these agreements should be limited. Will you ensure that provisional agreements are not treated as entitlements by giving very clear guidance on what factors make a school eligible for one? 
Thank you for that uh, question. And it touches, as you know, on a range of areas. So I'll try to give you a response that uh, is, is not simple, uh, but if it goes on too long, feel free to cut me off at some point, okay? Uh, and look, everybody probably knows the history. When I was the director of the CFPB, we saw two major chains of for-profit colleges, the Corinthian Colleges, set of schools, and ITT that we could see. We had the data. They were failing students. They were not keeping their promises to students. They were abusing the federal student aid programs. We took action against them, and both of them were shut down. Uh, and there were many, many students, many thousands of students who were affected uh, by that and have gotten uh, student loan relief as a result under the closed school discharge uh, uh, provisions and so forth. At, the, at FSA, we have just created an office of enforcement. Uh, it's actually reinstituting something that was done five years ago that was rolled back into the previous administration. I think it is better for taxpayers, better for the public, and it will be better for borrowers if we have strong oversight over these programs around the country. Now, let me just say, it doesn't target a particular category of schools as between for-profits, non-profits, public schools, uh, but we will go where the risk is greatest and where we see people failing borrowers, where there are high cohort default rates, whatever school that is, we will, we will look at that and go after that. If there are high delinquency rates, if there are other ways in which these schools are failing borrowers, it may be, and, and a lot of data would suggest that that will be more frequent problem at for-profit schools. If so, those are the ones we will, go, we will target, uh, not because of their status, but because of what their performance is for borrowers and taxpayers. And I think that's the right approach, but we'd be happy to have input from you all as we develop that office and we set its priorities about what the right way is to handle this. We'll follow up for sure with you on that because we have some thoughts on that. Uh, I guess, you know, just following revoked provisional agreements when they've been violated. And so that is going to be very, very important for us. And I think, you know, the other thing I want to just ask you about, I have limited time. One of the requirements for institutions to receive direct loans includes a timely submission of financial reports but many fail to do so. And the, clear, the, the law clearly requires those audits before an institution can originate loans. And yet to date, the department has never denied their eligibility for direct loans. So will the enforcement unit that you're setting up increase that accountability for participation in direct loans and other types of federal student aid? It's an excellent question. It's part of the answer that I was starting to give that I didn't get to, uh, which is this. You know, schools need to be, they need to have uh, agreements that uh, direct their performance, and they need to be held accountable for that performance. And there need to be protections for taxpayers here, whether it's posting of letters of credit, which is appropriate in certain instances, whether it's signature requirements. These are all things we're looking at. These are all things that probably should be used more substantially than they have in the past. We will look at those things. Again, we'll be glad to take input from you all on that. But we do think that schools can't just walk away from their obligations, leave tax holders holding the bag, and anybody could think that that's a fair and appropriate system. Great. And I hope you'll make these things transparent as well, you know, in terms of warning letters and advisory opinions so that students can be aware of their school standings. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Mr. Grothman from Wisconsin, you're live. Good. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Kudre, for coming on over. Um, first of all, um, the Office of Financial Student Aid is in charge of producing reports to Congress on the department's experimental sites. One of the sites that I'm interested in is called Direct Loan Program Limiting Unsubsidized Loan Amounts. That site was created in 2011, and the department is yet to submit a report to Congress on its results, despite a clear statutory mandate to do so. Um, earlier this month, Ranking member Fox and I sent you a letter to the department requesting the overdue report, and we haven't even received an answer yet. Will you commit that you will fulfill your statutory mandate and submit a report on this experimental site by next week? So let me say that uh, to the extent that that is a commitment that you think was uh, made and not fulfilled going back to 2011, that's 10 years of the department not doing that. Uh, and I've been here now for a few months and I have not heard of that before. Uh, what I will be happy to do is take that back uh, 
within the department, talk that through and get you an answer to your question, which it seems to me you deserve. Uh, if in fact, what you're correctly stating is a statutory requirement that hasn't been met over the past 10 years, we will understand why that has, has been so. Uh, and we will look to make sure that we're fulfilling all statutory requirements that we're expected to fulfill. So I, I take that seriously and we will take that back and we will get you an answer. Whether we will get you a report within a week, question if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, second thing, on a staff call, you said that uh, the Office of Federal Student Aid works with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to monitor federal student loan servicers. During the conversation, you noted that you were unaware if there was a formal agreement in place, such as a, um, a memo of understanding or something more informal, and that you would check on that. Do you know, is there a, a memo of understanding between FSA and CFPB? And if so, what information does the FCA sh share with the CFPB and vice versa? So, so my understanding is that the proper approach here is one federal government and that different agencies of the federal government that have overlapping responsibilities should help one another uh, in, in service of fulfilling what ultimately are objectives that were set by Congress in the law. All right, so we want to carry out the law as you gave us most effectively. Uh, sometimes that's done through memorandum of understanding when there's formality that is needed. For example, when I was head of the CFPB, we were required by law to have a memorandum of understanding with the Federal Trade Commission. We will be looking at those situations. Other times the agencies just collaborate and cooperate on a more informal basis. Uh, we will look at those situations and determine what's appropriate. And if your office wants to give input into that, we will be happy to hear that uh, from you. Okay. Is there a memo memorandum of understanding there? Do you know? Uh, again, it, it, it's complicated because there might be, there are different issues. There might be complaint uh, intake and resolution. There might be enforcement okay. and oversight. There are different aspects, but we can okay. get you, we can get you a very specific answer on that uh, if you'd like. Okay. So finally, uh, where is the statutory authority for FSA uh, or where in the statutory authority for FSA does it allow you to cede your responsibility and give authority to another agency? Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Where, uh, where in HEA does it authorize CFPB to exercise authority over federal loan services or take action against them? And I don't think it does. Uh, so you and Secretary Cardona are responsible for running FSA and overseeing the federal contractors. Despite partisan policy wishes, the statutory language is clear and your performance-based metrics are based on your work in FSA and not handing your work to another agency. Do you believe that so? Yeah, I'd like, I'd frame it a little differently, okay? I don't think that we should hand our work to another agency. That wouldn't be appropriate. We have statutory authority to do certain work and we need to carry it out and we will. The CFPB also has its own statutory authority and they have work that they need to carry out and they will. Sometimes the, the, those areas of work will overlap. And when they do overlap, the right way for us to handle it so as not to duplicate efforts for taxpayers or waste effort is to coordinate and to consult closely together so that we get the best bang for our buck collectively where there is overlap. So that, that would be how I would frame it, I believe. Okay. It, it's not like a relationship, say, uh, with FTC, because that relationship is authorized under higher ed. Is there any reference to uh, CFPB? So, so, so again, I wouldn't only look at the higher education statutes. I'd look at the CFPB's own statutes. They do have authority. I recall it well. I was the director of that agency. They have authority over student loans to a considerable degree. We worked cooperatively with the Department of Education during that period and vice versa. We will work cooperatively with the CFPB where there are areas of overlap. Uh, and again, I'd be happy to follow up with you further on that uh, as, as you wish. We'll give you a follow-up question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Chairman Wilson and Ranking Member Murphy. Also, thank you, Mr. Cordray, for the excellent work you're doing on student loans. It's very difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult issue. And I think that uh, the path you are leading um, is, is so helpful to so many of our students um, and, um, and, and what we need to have happen with regards to uh, the F, you know, 
FAFSA, which I still am uh, filling out for my students, my, my children. I wanted to get your perspective on the importance of financial fitness for students, you know, understanding important financial concepts like saving for retirement, managing student loan repayments, investing is really fundamental to closing the wealth gap in our country. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be introducing the Bipartisan Financial Fitness Act with my colleague, Congresswoman Sparts, and our bill will require the Secretary of Education to create a public financial resources online portal to help students build these financial competencies. Uh, could you speak uh, briefly about uh, whether the ability and the lack of, or the lack of knowledge of important financial concepts makes it difficult for students to stay on track with loan repayments and increase their wealth in the long run? Yeah, if I could, let me just make a quick comment on the beginning of your question, then let me turn to your question, which I consider quite important. It's very near to my heart. The comment I would make is you said at the beginning that I'm doing excellent work. I've been here six months. I work as hard as I can every day to do as much as I can, but I do very little myself. The people at FSA, the 1,400 colleagues I have here, I have found to be high performers. They're making a huge difference. They're taking on very significant challenges that the, the other uh, questioners have, have touched on and I'm sure we'll touch on further. And they're, they're doing a terrific job and I appreciate that and am grateful for it. As to your question about financial fitness, this is something that's been near to my heart, I will tell you, for 20, 20 years, uh, actually 30 years goes back to in the legislature, uh, I pushed for uh, a, a uh, financial fitness provision in, in the state of Ohio. Uh, later at uh, CFPB, uh, I was the vice chair of the Financial Literacy uh, Education Commission, which is a federal government uh, set of agencies that brings together all the federal government departments and agencies that deal with financial fitness. And we worked on a number of initiatives. I'm now uh, testified in front of that group for the first time in four years, now that I'm back here uh, last month. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with them. There is much we can do, as you say, to help families understand what their obligations are, what their risks are, and make good choices with eyes wide open before they get into a problem. And the college scorecard, which is something we pioneered when I was the director of CFPB, uh, and by the way, Rohit Chopra was our student loan ombudsman, now the new director of the CFPB. He, he got that accomplished with the Department of Education and it's something we built on over the years, which again, gives, gives families the right information when they need it to make good choices. Uh, and that will make families better off in this country. But it, these are hard matters, as you say, they're complicated issues. People understanding of money is not always as, as yes. deep as we would like. Uh, and it's something we need to work at every day uh, to, to make this country stronger. Thank you. And, you know, we use the term financial fitness in a housing organization I helped lead for 20 years so that we talk about it not as illiteracy, but it's what makes us strong. Quickly, uh, uh, the FSA and under your tenure has prioritized improving the public service loan for business program. I know you've talked to borrowers across the country and started a negotiated rulemaking to make permanent changes. You also recently announced a limited time waiver of some of the eligibility Ability criteria. Um, can you talk to us about what steps FSA is taking to communicate with borrowers about this uh, and why it's so important to make sure that student borrowers know about this benefit and can apply? I appreciate that question. It's something we're working hard on right now. I go back to the old uh, saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? You know, we, we have some great advances here on the public service loan forgiveness program. If people don't know about them or don't know to take advantage of them, many of them will be wasted and there'll be missed opportunities for people. We don't want that to happen. We have already begun communicating to, uh, I believe, to more than 500,000 current borrowers, and we'll be reaching out to all borrowers who may or may not ever have applied before for public service loan forgiveness, or may in the past have applied and be told it doesn't apply to you, but now there's new broader criteria. Uh, we will be working to get that message out. But by the way, you all can help us get that message out. Your constituents listen to you. They respect you. They know you know things. And if you tell them this is a new day, take another crack at it, see what you can find out for yourself, uh, direct them to us, and we will do our best to serve them. We would appreciate that help. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired and I yield back.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we do want, uh, Mr. Cadre, I do want him to know that we totally support the 10,000 uh, loan forgiveness uh, from the president of the United States. So that's the chairman of the Higher Education Workforce on the Work, Labor and Workforce Committee, Education and Labor Committee. Uh, I'll communicate that back to uh, the secretary and the people at the department uh, with, with your blessing, I uh, thank Madam Chair. And we look forward to his memo and when it uh, is being published to the public. And now Ms. Banks of uh, Indiana. Ms. McLean. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And as always, you're looking nice today. Um, I appreciate you being here and I appreciate um, the opportunity to ask some questions. Mr. Cordray, as you spoke earlier is, you know, you wanna protect the taxpayers and you want there to be some accountability. Um, and, I, and I think we're all in agreement on protection for the taxpayers because at the end of the day, the, the government cannot give $1 of which it does not take from someone else. So with that said, can you help me understand, it looks like in January, roughly 45 million student loan borrow, borrowers, excuse me, will re return to the loan payment process um, after almost two years of, of not doing so because of the pandemic and whatnot. But recently under the Biden administration, we also have three of those nine loan servicers exit the industry. So I'm curious, of the, th I have a couple questions first, of, a, of those three that have exited the industry, what is the dollar amount of the loans that they service? Well, I'll, I'll give it to you the way I'm most familiar, which is the number of accounts that we're talking about uh, is a little more than 15 million. So it's a very okay. significant part of the portfolio, thank, I would agree. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do, who will service those accounts now? Will they go into a new company? Will they go into the other six remaining? How is that going to work? So I, I can give you a long and detailed answer, and I will if you like. Uh, the short answer is there are other servicers who are quite eager uh, to be participating in this program and to have more accounts, and they are stepping up here. So for example, uh, the Granite State portfolio is, is moving to Ed Financial. The Navient portfolio is moving to Maximus. Uh, the FIA portfolio is, is the largest, and therefore it's having to move to several servicers. But there is great interest in that. Okay. Some of those accounts will move to Nelnet, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. I can, I can give Thank you, you, sir. Thank first. you. If you could provide a written list of who's servicing those debts, that would be helpful. And have those already been determined? So, so I will say that much of it is determined, some of it is a further work in progress. And the reason some of it's a further work in progress is with the FIA portfolio, as we transfer accounts to certain other servicers, we want to kind of keep an eye on the performance and we sure. want to direct more accounts to those that are performing better so that so I can't give you all the determinations yet because we're at a snapshot in what time. What do you think you'll but, be able to give us those determinations? Because in three months or four months, depending yeah. on how we count, these lo the loan the people who have the loans will have to begin to write checks to these people. Yeah, well, what I've just stated gives you the answer to that for more than half of the borrowers we're talking about, which, which is wonderful. And, but yes, that, that's okay. fine. We we will give you. I'll, I'll be ha we'll be happy to give you what information we have currently and uh, what information is not yet known, uh, and keep you updated on that over time, since that's an interest of yours. If I'm hearing you correctly. Well, I think it's an interest of mine and I think it's an interest of the taxpayers, one, to make sure that we hold, you know, government accountable to making sure that government is really good at spending money. That's fair we're enough. Really, we agree on really that. Good we at agree spending on that. Money. We're yeah. really, eh, we're working on a lot of stuff when it comes to loan repayments and getting our taxpayer monies back. So one of the things I think um, we should be cognizant of, um, and, and I would say I know this from the 30 plus years that I've actually spent in business having to sign the front of checks, not just the back of checks, is before we go out and give a bunch of money, let's make sure 
that we have the other end of the stick, which is let's also make sure we have a really good solid program to recoup the money of which the taxpayers actually deserve. So I, 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 think, I, that's think, where, I think that's where you and I agree and maybe all of us can agree uh, to the extent we're spending money, we should be making sure we're getting value for that money. If we're not getting value for that money, we should not be spending it. If we are getting value for that money, we can then, you know, perhaps debate and about and I it a little bit. I, I like the political speak and I appreciate that, but I'm not talking about value for money. What I'm talking about is if I have a home loan, if I have a mortgage and I say to the bank, give me $200,000. The bank also has a really clear, precise contract of which I need to repay that loan. The val I, I can't go back to the loan company and say, hey, but I'm getting a lot of value from living in this house. That doesn't really pay the bills, right? So as much as you and I appreciate the value for money, I, I'm going to take it a step further to protect the taxpayers is if we are going to give this money, we got to make sure we have a solid plan to recapture the loan repayment. So I look forward to it. And thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your point and I understand it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can follow up in writing to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Like that. Okay. Thank you so much. And now Representative Manning, uh, you're live from North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Cordray, for being with us today. During the Obama administration, the department worked cooperatively with state law enforcement agencies like your state's attorneys general to investigate and hold unscrupulous for-profit colleges accountable. This priority, like many other policies designed to protect students and taxpayers, was reversed under Secretary DeVos. And I want to applaud the FSA for announcing the reinstatement of its enforcement unit on October 8th. Uh, to strengthen oversight of predatory institutions. I am working on a proposal to codify the enforcement unit so that it cannot lay dormant under uh, another administration. I also wanna commend the FSA for working with the Federal Trade Commission to increase interagency collaboration and coordination of enforcement actions against predatory for-profit colleges. So could you talk to us about the multi-level strategy that needs to be used to hold predatory for-profit institutions accountable and perhaps talk about additional partnerships that you believe would be helpful in this work. Sure, and, and again, uh, this is, as you say, a very important development and it was an important policy change. You know, the, the previous administration had basically blocked states from having any effective role here in overseeing companies that have a significant impact on many, many thousands of people within their states. And it seemed to me that we should be working together. None of us has enough people to do all the oversight uh, of these programs that, that we would like to, to do and that taxpayers should demand. And if we work together and we pool our, our efforts and our resources, we're going to do a better job. That's what we intend uh, to do here. So it's not that we're trying to get other people to do our work for us. They've got work they want to do. We've got work that we need to do. Some of that work overlaps. And if we can do it together, that's effective. For example, I will say right now that uh, we have accounts, and, and the previous question had asked about this, that are transferring from one servicer to another. We want to make sure that that is going smoothly. There are a lot of state officials who want to make sure that's going smoothly as well. The CFPB wants that to be going smoothly as well. Some of this overlaps with their area. Right now we have uh, FSA people overseeing those transfers together with working with CFPB officials, working with state officials from 17 states, I believe, to make sure that goes as well as possible. With that group of people working together, we'll do better than any of us could alone. And that's a, a good principle for us to follow across the federal uh, and, and federalist government of the United States, it seems to me. Thank you. I have a particular interest in the conversion of for-profits to nonprofits by the purchasing or collaborating with nonprofit uh, institutions because we have a situation involving that in my state of North Carolina. And the GAO recently investigated the process through which for-profit institutions convert to nonprofit status and found serious shortcomings, including the possibility of insiders 
taking advantage of nonprofit institutions at student and taxpayer expense through a variety of different creative methods. The GAO also found a disparity between the Internal Revenue Service's approval of nonprofit status and the department's approval. So what steps has the department taken to address the risk of insiders taking advantage of the converted institution in for-profit conversions as part of the change in ownership reviews? And, and um, can you talk a little bit also about what information practices and expertise could be shared by the department with the IRS in their reviews of such conversions? Sure. Uh, and, and by the way, information sharing between FSA and IRS has, has really moved forward in a very positive way. Uh, they are working closely with us. That makes our work more effective, and we appreciate those efforts. To, to the point you made, and it's an insightful question about uh, conversion status of these institutions, let me just put it simply. If you or I had financial obligations and we went to court to try to change our name and the court let us change our name, that wouldn't let us get out of our financial obligations. And similarly, if you have a for-profit school that thinks that they're gonna be treated more lightly if they convert to not-for-profit status, that's inappropriate. It is, it is not uh, uh, consistent with the demands we should make on these schools. Uh, and we will scrutinize those, those conversions carefully. And we have the ability to deny them if they're not justified. And we have the ability to put conditions on them, again, to make sure taxpayers are protected, to make sure students are protected. We will do that. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Dr. Fox, our ranking member of the committee, welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Cordry, uh, the committee has written several letters requesting information regarding the return to repayment and have yet to receive responses. Further, the committee has received just a few briefings from your staff regarding this important issue and we're left with either vague statements about incoming plans that have yet to be announced or false statements regarding when the repayment pause would expire. When Congress learns more about the department's plans for this unprecedented operation from Politico than it does from the COO of FSA, I question whether such lack of transparency is intentional or just incompetence. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to clarify this for me on the record, and I need quick answers, please. Mr. Cordry, on what date did the administrative forbearance go into effect? First go into effect. You mean the, the payment pause? Is that what, what I would call the payment pause? You mean in March, 2020, when mm -hmm. the uh, previous administration what? recognized the pandemic? Mark, uh, just give me the date, please. What date did the administrative forbearance first go into effect? Okay, so if you're talking about the payment pause, I'm not sure how you're defining administrative forbearance. Uh, that took effect in March, 2020, okay. uh, when the declarations were made and was followed mm -hmm. up quickly by the CARES Act. What day was this pause first extended? Uh, I, I believe it was extended multiple times under the Trump administration. Uh, I, I don't recall exactly because I wasn't in this position, but I believe it was again in November, maybe again in January. Uh, then it was extended under the new administration right away in January and then once more. And we now have a final deadline of people will return to repayment after January 31st. 2022. So what, did, what did the press release accompanying that announcement say about when the payments would restart? Well, I, it, 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 I assume and, and re recall that it correctly stated that this is a final deadline on return to repayment and the payments will start sometime after January 31st, 2022, not before January 31st, but anytime after what happens with these payments, just again, I don't mean to give you too much detail, but, it, but is that people don't all pay on the same day of the month. They're staggered throughout the month, depending on uh, uh, you know, a variety of things that let, allows us to process payments in a smoother fashion. So it's not the case that everybody will start paying on February 1st, but everybody will start repaying after January 31st, and they will all get notice of their specific date uh, ahead of time so that they will know that. Uh, Mr. Cordray, on April 3rd, 2021, we sent a letter regarding a report that was commissioned 
by FSA analyzing the true value of student loan portfolio, to which your staff responded with a heavily redacted copy of the requested document. Uh, I know you sent the response yesterday, but as Dr. Murphy said in his opening statement, you know that response didn't answer our question. I'm asking again for the unredacted copy. Just saying the previous administration redacted, it's not an acceptable answer. You have the report. You can share an unredacted copy. The secretary testified before the committee on June 24th and said he would work with the committee and share what the department has. Why is the department hiding this report? Uh, so again, that's a report that predates my time at FSA and the But answer... you have the report. So let, Just let's... release it. You let's... have it. Okay. Release let me, it. Let, do you want me to answer your question? I'll be happy to answer it. Shall I? Yes. Okay, so the, the response to you, which was not from me, but from others at the department, was that this report was released previously, and it was redacted by the previous administration, and we have now released the report again with the same redacted material that the prior administration provided, uh, and that's our understanding of the appropriate response. If you want to have more follow-up on that, sounds like you do. Uh, I think the department will be happy to have that discussion with you. By do the way, you, I'm also told. Believe, I'm also believe, told that. Mr. I'm, 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 may I just? May I just? I'm also told that if you'd like to have a briefing on the issues in that report and on the financial underpinnings of it, people would be happy to do that with you. And maybe do, that let me let me ask my next question. Do you believe taxpayers should be aware about the true value of the student loan portfolio? After all. Uh, they are the ones who are ultimately on the hook for any unrecovered funds used to finance this program. Again, uh, I think we should all be aware of the accurate numbers about these things. There's some question whether the methodology used in that particular report, and there have been many other reports over the years, is the most accurate. And again, people would be happy to brief you from the department on the details of that, and we would offer that to you, and hopefully that would help cut through this a bit for you. Uh, now, now, Mr. Cordray, we want the public to know what this is, not just to be briefed on it and not be allowed then to share that information. You have the report. We should have it. If you don't like the methodology, then you explain why the methodology is bad. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. I'm sure they, uh, there will be some follow-up on that concern. Uh, and now... Um, Chairman of the committee, the distinguished chairman, uh, Dr. Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Cordry, for your hard work um, in Ohio and consumer finance and now at uh, uh, student loans. Um, the first question is the FAFSA form was redesigned and simplified a couple of years ago, uh, several months ago, um, to, well, I guess, about over a year ago. Um, and I understand that there are some problems in implementing those changes. Uh, it seems to me that we should implement as much of that reform as possible without delay, because otherwise the students will miss out on benefits, particularly enhanced um, uh, Pell Grant awards. Uh, can you work with our staff to make sure that as much of that gets um, um, implemented as possible without having to extend the whole program? Yeah, can, can, I, can I say a couple things about that? Uh, and first of all, we very much appreciate that both the Future Act and the FAFSA Simplification Act, many of you worked hard in the Congress to get those enacted and they represent you know, leaps forward in the FAFSA form uh, process. It simplifies the form, should make it easier for people to fill it out, should get more access to federal student aid on clearer a clearer picture for families of what they're getting into uh, and information sharing with the IRS helps us be much more efficient and effective about this. In terms of the current situation uh, where there's discussions in Congress about uh, you know, how to implement that and, and when and which pieces, we're happy to take our guidance from you all in the Congress on that. Uh, we have made it plain uh, that uh, you know, this is a matter of costs for taxpayers and costs for borrowers about getting this implemented properly. And we wanna make sure that we do that. Uh, and we also have said, you know, very frankly, that we need more time because we have to replace a 47 year old mainframe well, system that-, that, that That's that, right. If you could work with us to make sure we can get as much implemented as possible so students don't miss out on their benefits. 
Uh, again, we want to make this effective for, for families and borrowers as quickly as possible. Okay. We will do as much as we can as quickly as possible. I have, we I have, can't I have, get it have, all have, done have, within I have, two years. I have other questions, so I, I assume you'll be working with our staff to make sure that we do that as quickly as possible. The Congress has given the Department of Education broad authority to find institutions that have abused student aid systems to place limitations and their participation in Title IV and to seek recovery of financial losses against owners and executives of such institutions. But the Department of Education has been failing to do that, leaving the taxpayers and students to pay the price when institutions engage in fraudulent activities that leave, leave them stuck with, with the bill. In, our, in a hearing we had in March, a witness said we should use that authority. Um, I, now, let me just say that when I say use that authority against the owners and executives, I'm not talking about strict liability. I'm talking about triggering that authority when the executives have personal involvement in the fraud, you're talking into consideration the seriousness of the fraud, and the amount of money the executives made off the fraud, taking that into consideration, uh, how much they profited. Um, and obviously, if we did that, it would deter future um, future fraud. Is that something the committee, the department is looking at? So I will say we had that letter from you. I heard you loud and clear on that. We see eye to eye on this. We absolutely agree. More needs to be done to prevent people from abusing these student aid programs, from cheating taxpayers, from cheating students. That's part of why we're setting up the Office of Enforcement. We will look forward to keeping you apprised of our progress in dealing with the issues you raised in that letter. I think they're important issues and we agree uh, on the direction here. And I thought it was a good bit of a kick in the behind for us to make sure that we're moving down the road on this and we will. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, the Next Generation Financial Services environment known as Next Gen uh, would simplify the um, direct student loan borrowers access to information through a website. It was um, de devised by the Obama administration and kind of left and not much happened. Um, could you explain um, um, the status of that? And I hope you have more to explain than you can in the little time we have left. I want to get in another question. So if you can provide in writing uh, the status of that while I get to an another question. That's fine. I, I, we will provide you in writing. We have a lot of things we're doing, and they are going to make that much better for borrowers. Uh, and I'm excited about what our team is coming up with. We're, they're doing a great job on this, uh, and we'll be happy to give you all the details. And, and my final question is, what authority does the uh, department have in things like reducing interest rates, allowing refinancing, and um, uh, fixing the public service loan forgiveness. Have you done a lot of work on that? And uh, we want to thank you on it. Uh, but if you could give us, uh, my time has expired, so you're going to have to do that um, uh, as a, as a follow up and bring us uh, up to date on how that's work, work working. Um, another question I'd like would be the um, ten thousand dollar discharge. Uh, how much of that is non-performing loans so that discharging it wouldn't really cost anything other than relieving us of the cost of servicing those loans and um, um, whether or not um, um, what you are doing with the loan servicers to make sure they're doing their jobs as students sign up in January to make sure that um, they're signing up for, appropriately for student loan forgiveness um, in, uh, bar defense, interest-based uh, uh, repayment, and all of those, what kind of guidance you're given. If you could do that in writing, uh, because I'm obviously over time, and I appreciate the uh, chair, chair, chairwoman's uh, uh, forbearance. Okay, those are good questions, and we'll be glad to give you some good answers, and then you tell us if you need more, all right? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, it would be helpful uh, if you presented those of questions and writing to Mr. Cordray's office so that he can follow up with you in writing. Those are questions that all of us would like to have answers to. So if the committee would be so kind as to distribute that to all of the members of the subcommittee on higher education and workforce investment, we would certainly uh, appreciate it. Very well, do. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, 
we want to welcome Mr. Bowman of New York, the vice president of this uh, committee, vice chair. Vice president sounds good. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> really appreciate great. the time. <laughs> Mr. Cordray, I have a, a little more airtime for you, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, as you know, I'm a strong advocate for canceling student debt. And I recently joined several of my colleagues on the committee in a letter led by Representative Omar calling to both President Biden and Secretary Cardona to release the student debt cancellation memo we were told would be made available more than six months ago. The student debt crisis is a racial justice issue. A recent report by the Education Trust described how student debt is steeped in systemic racism and exacerbated by racial inequities in wages, wealth, access to education, and more. Black borrowers often feel trapped in a vicious cycle of lifelong debt they cannot escape from, and many of them, especially Black women, actually face more student debt today than they did when they graduated. The report called the, this issue Jim Crow Debt and highlighted the voices, experiences, and perspectives of Black borrowers, which are far too often overlooked in our conversations about the student debt crisis. Researchers concluded that centering these perspectives and addressing the racial inequities in student debt requires that the federal government cancel all student debt. Mr. Cordray, how is the Office of Federal Student Aid actively centering and prioritizing the voices and experiences of Black borrowers in your work? And how do you respond to the finding that limiting debt cancellation would harm Black borrowers the most? So I appreciate, Representative Bowman, the perspective you laid out in your question uh, and, and agree with much of it. And by the way, there's a lot of statistical data that I think supports uh, various pieces of what you said. Uh, one of the ways FSA can be most helpful here is we are an operational uh, shop that has access to a great deal of data on federal student aid, uh, you know, all the data, and we use it to uh, effectively manage the program. And to the extent we can provide that information to you or to the, the, to the department or to the White House, if they're asking for it, we certainly do so. We want to inform the decisions that are made on this as much as possible. Again, Decisions about general loan forgiveness are not my decisions to make. Uh, they will be made elsewhere. We will do our best to implement whatever is done. Uh, I do think that uh, loan forgiveness for, for Americans where it's appropriate and justified makes a huge difference in their lives, gives them a chance to get sound footing and move forward and better their lives rather than being stuck with this millstone around their necks. Uh, and where that's appropriate to do so, and there's authority to do so, uh, you know, we will enthusiastically implement that. And I, and I hear you having that same perspective as well. I appreciate that. And I would love for my office to be in touch with you so we can uh, get access to some of that data that you mentioned so we can get a, a holistic uh, and much better and more comprehensive understanding of the issue. Um, so, so we will definitely love to work with you on that. Um, I had another question about Parent PLUS loans. Um, I've heard from many of my constituents that depending on how their Parent PLUS loan was structured, they may not have benefited from the pause in payments during the pandemic and have been struggling to stay out of default all this time. Specifically, if a parent took out a Parent PLUS loan before 2010, it could have come out of the Federal Family Education Loan Program, most of which were held by private lenders. Parent PLUS, lo plus loans also face absurdly high interest rates and exclusion from some income-driven repayment plans. These parents, many of whom have faced extraordinary financial hardship and suffering during the pandemic, don't get much attention when we talk about the student debt crisis, but they need our help. They should not have to push for off retirement or face financial devastation just because they want to help their kids get an education. Is your office considering improvements to Parent PLUS loans? And if so, can you describe your vision for these improvements? Yeah, again, I, I'll just say that uh, the issue of what to do about different types of loans, as you know, there's a blizzard of different categories of loans under the program that have been developed over many years. Uh, and some of it gets to be quite complex. Uh, and actually in preparing for this hearing, we went over the issue of Parent PLUS loans, where I understand there's some dissatisfaction from some that they didn't get all the relief that other loans got. Uh, and there are reasons for that that uh, I, I don't have time to necessarily get into in detail, 
Uh, but we are open to hearing more from you all about whether Parent PLUS loans should be covered under this program or that program uh, and having a dialogue back and forth. And we would, we would welcome that, certainly. So would you say that your office is just beginning the process of sort of engaging around Parent PLUS loans and, and uh, the strengths and weaknesses of them and, 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 and all of that? You are not yet considering improvements. You're just trying to get a better understanding of uh, the complex nature of the Parent PLUS loans as well as other loans? I would say that's mostly right, but not entirely. Certainly, people thought about Parent PLUS loans when uh, the payment pause was, was put in place and then other forgiveness for public service loan, loan forgiveness and the like. Uh, and it's, it's always been a bit of a difficult edge of this in terms of what is included, what is not included. But I think there's, there's an openness to further discussions about this. Uh, and, and trying to think it through. So I don't, wouldn't say we're at the beginning of thinking about it. It's something that has come up uh, you know, various times, but I think there's still an openness to hearing more about it. Uh, nothing is closed at this point is my understanding. Okay. Well, Thank Gordon, you so much, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Yes, we, we would appreciate an answer to that question also in writing for the benefit of the committee, because all of us are interested and the parent plus lands. And unfortunately, this hearing only gives you five minutes to answer such an important question. That is- now, I understand, Madam Chair, you're piling up the homework for us, but we'll be glad to take it on and we'll get it back to you as quickly as we reasonably can. That, that lets you know how important your work <laughs> is and how important this particular issue impacts so many people. And we appreciate your uh, cooperation. And yep. now, uh, Representative Pocan, welcome. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Mr. Corduroy. Corduroy. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for your uh, long uh, commitment to public service as well. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I have a bill that I introduced back in 2013 that came uh, out of the grassroots of my constituents on refinancing of student loans. Um, as you know, uh, we're at kind of historically low interest rates, yet we've got a lot of people who are paying 6% plus uh, interest rates on old loans. And uh, we had introduced a bill um, to allow people to be able to refinance their student loans at the lowest available um, current rate. Uh, the idea being that would happen in the free market, um, but somehow it doesn't happen with student loans. And as you know, it's not necessarily easy to do this process. Can, can you think of any reason why that shouldn't be the law of the land, allowing people to be able to refinance at the lowest available rate? So I, I've heard over the years, various proposals along these lines from leaders like yourself in the House and the Senate, that the interest rates are higher, that maybe they're higher than businesses and developers pay, et cetera. Uh, you know, those, those interest rates are typically set by statute, uh, as you know, and if they're gonna be modified, they need to be modified uh, by statute. Uh, we would be open to providing the kind of, I think they call it technical assistance or other data that we can provide that would be helpful to you in trying to determine what the impact is. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would just say in general, I've dealt with financial issues in federal and state government for years and years. It's obvious that higher interest rates make it harder for people to climb out of debt. Lower interest makes make it easier what's fair and what's appropriate and what the right uh, match is to some sort of federal funds rate or something is for you to determine. Uh, but if we can help you by giving you data so that you can see what the consequences are one way or another, we'd be happy to try to provide that. Sure, and, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but so you don't think there's any reason why that would be a problem to do that at this point? Well, look, anytime you're talking about numbers and dollars, there is a problem. There's either too much or too little and it's for Congress to decide what's the Goldilocks right amount, uh, not for me to decide per se. Uh, I may have thoughts about it, but uh, that's not my role here. Uh, and if that's- Actually, I'm asking you that very question is what are your thoughts yeah. about this? You're allowed to have thoughts and I would love to hear them. <laughs> yes, I, I'm allowed to have thoughts, but uh, I don't want to get in front of uh, you know the secretary or the White House or others who have this decision to make. But frankly, in this case, it's you, the Congress that has the decision to make. Look, higher interest rates put borrowers in a more difficult position uh, and lower interest rates would make it more plausible and feasible for them to pay off their loans. Again, that's a very obvious point. I'm not telling you anything that anybody doesn't know, 
But in terms of what the right level is or whether it should be the Fed funds rate or something else, again, that's a policy decision for you. Uh, and if I were in the Congress, I'd be asking the question and trying to figure it out myself, but I don't want to, want to pretend that that's my role. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so let me ask you another question about uh, tuition creep. Have, has the administration discussed uh, ways to try to address that? I know that's one of the issues that uh, you know people seem to have is that the cost of higher education is going up at a faster rate than um, you know the consumer price index or uh, anything else. And because of that, that's putting an undue burden on folks. Have you guys discussed that issue at all? You know, that's been true for years. Uh, we saw that trajectory when I was at the CFPB. It was at that point for the first time uh, that, again, Rohit Chopra, our student loan ombudsman, was able to point out that the total aggregate student loan debt had just exceeded $1 trillion for the first time. And by the way, it's already now at somewhere between $1.5 and $1.6 uh, trillion. Uh, in terms of why that is so, whether schools are charging too much, uh, you know, those are policy issues that, uh, you know, people wrestle with. Uh, if we could keep a lid on higher education costs, that would make it easier to finance this program and make it easier on borrowers and their families. Uh, all the mechanics that go into that, including state government laws, federal government laws, and, and what uh, oversight of institutions are. It's not really in my purview to tell institutions how much they can charge students Although obviously we get the back end of that, which is people repaying the loans to, to, to pay those amounts. Uh, but it's, it's, I would say it's definitely a concern. Higher education costs have outpaced inflation. They have risen to very high levels. Are we pricing families out of the market? Are we doing that uh, by, by imposing significant debt at the federal level? These are, these are serious issues and worthy of serious consideration. And I urge you to keep, keep pressing on them. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCain. And now, uh, Mr. Uh, Good of Virginia. Thank you, Chair Wilson and Ranking Murphy for holding this hearing. Uh, I'm concerned by the recent announcement of the Biden administration that they're going to continue to freeze the student loan payments through January 31st of 2022. Uh, continuing the student loan payment freeze will saddle students with an albatross of debt even further down the road rather than having them start or continue to pay down their balances. While uh, heavy handed government shutdowns have forced unemployment on many Americans, we all know there's no longer a labor shortage uh, or there is now a labor shortage with uh, 10 million job openings. So there's no justified reason to continue the student loan freeze. Uh, Mr. Cordray, uh, in your past role in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, you talked a lot about predatory lending uh, today, the federal government itself projects that more than a quarter of all Stafford loans were, will default. Uh, I served 17 years in the lending industry, and I can tell you that no business could survive a 25% default rate. It's only the government that would operate uh, with that kind of a default rate. And any business would have to quickly close its doors. It certainly wouldn't continue the practice of business as usual. However, the government still proceeds with granting loans to millions of borrowers with few restrictions. Knowingly making loans where one in four will default seems the very definition of predatory to me. Uh, making loans to unqualified and perhaps unsuspecting borrowers who have no demonstrated ability to repay and they can so easily find themselves caught on the treadmill of automatic annual renewal. Uh, it appears that the federal government's policy is let's put our students in as much debt as we can and just have the taxpayers fund the massively overpriced and ever-expanding budgets of these woke leftist liberal institutions of so-called higher learning. The taxpayer is losing in this, the student is losing in this, and it's only the, these progressive institutions with these massively increasing exorbitant prices that are laughing all the way to the bank on the back of the taxpayers and the students. Uh, Mr. Cordray, given your uh, documented uh, flip-flopping, both opposing and now supporting predatory lending practices, why do you think it's okay to cavalierly lend out taxpayer funds and saddle these, saddle these students with so much additional debt? Well, uh, thank you for the question. And what I would say uh, is this, uh, you know, the cost of uh, higher education is high. Uh, people need assistance to be able to access that and better their lives and improve their employment prospects for the future. 
And some do that and do that successfully and some do not. And it's a, it's a major public policy issue. It's an issue really more for Congress to decide, you know, what are the, what are the tenets of how we lend to students and their families and what kind of requirements are to be imposed. It's not for me to, to say, it's for you all to say, and my, my job is to run the program. Uh, by the way, I don't believe that I've changed position on this at all. Uh, I think that uh, the issue of federal student loans uh, is important in terms of accessing uh, ability to improve people's lives, but the ability to repay those loans and on the back end, there's a high number of defaults and we need to keep working at how we can improve these programs. So uh, in any event, I mean, we could have a debate about the different economic philosophies here that maybe you and I uh, have, and maybe they're not in full agreement, uh, but, uh, but beyond that, uh, I'm going to run this program as best I can. I'm going to do it to protect borrowers and students, and I'm going to do it to protect taxpayers as much as possible. Uh, and I'm happy to have your input as we do it uh, to make sure we do it as effectively as possible. Well, we're certainly not protecting taxpayers. And thank you for your answer. We're certainly not protecting taxpayers. The American people are not getting a good investment on their dollar with 25% default rate. And again, students are not coming out ahead if they don't have the ability uh, to repay. And again, the, 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 we are facilitating the rapid uh, inflation on college campuses uh, for frankly, non-academic expenses. Uh, and it, there's no end in sight to that. Mr. Cordray, you've leveled a lot of public criticism at your servicing partners. Uh, which seems to me to be, quite frankly, a bit of blame shifting, especially on public service loan forgiveness and other programs. You know, while that can make for some good press to beat up on them, this habit makes for bad partnerships. And you're certainly running a federal program that needs partners. And this year alone, you've had four key servicers, to my understanding, who have walked out on you or ceased the relationship there. Uh, given your history of supporting what I would call, again, this predatory lending practice here and the refusal of some service partners now to work with you, I don't know how the administration or the American people can expect you to put the students first here. What are you going to do to stop the hemorrhaging of these service partners? So, so I appreciate the question. Uh, and in fact, as, as I said, we have servicers servicing partners, if you, if you will, uh, who have stepped up and are eager to take more of our portfolio and we have ample capacity to serve the students and borrowers, and we will. And those who are exiting, uh, look, we're putting more performance and accountability into these contracts, and that's not comfortable for everyone. Or people just might over time, they were in the program, they have decided to go different directions. They're, they're free to make those choices and, and they have. Uh, but we have good servicers that we're working with here uh, that we're going to hold accountable. They're going to have to perform. They understand that. Borrowers and taxpayers should demand that they perform at a high level. Uh, and we're going to work with them to do that. But if they fail, they're going to be penalized. And that's the way this relationship should be. And that's the way it will be. The time has expired. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And now, Mr. Uh, Espriot from New York, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is uh, regarding discharging students' loans, which is almost impossible uh, under bankruptcy procedures. Uh, students must uh, bring a separate lawsuit within the bankruptcy matter to seek the discharge of their student loans. And the burden of proof is, in these cases, is very, very high, with students required to show that continuing to pay the debt uh, would impose an undue hardship. While there are statutory limitations that can and should be changed, uh, the department can also take steps to reduce the burden on borrowers who are already struggling financially to make it easier for them to secure relief under bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, my question is, uh, is the federal student, the FSA considering changing how it approaches uh, bankruptcy procedures by changing how it determines which bankruptcies to contest or by better defining undue hardships standards to reflect the realities faced by student loan borrowers? Excellent question. I appreciate it very much. The way you described the bankruptcy process and how it applies to federal student loans is very much the way I understand that process. And I think that it doesn't work well. Uh, and we think that it needs to be reformed and reevaluated, and we are committed to doing that. I will tell you that there have been discussions already with the Justice Department. They too are willing 
to, to have us review and, and revise uh, our approach here. Uh, we think that that would be uh, better fitted to the realities of life for many people who struggle in bankruptcy uh, and are forced to go into court, if you can imagine such a thing, and recount how miserable their lives are in order to beg for some kind of bankruptcy relief and rarely get it. We don't think that that's the right place, uh, that this is the right outcome. Uh, we are gonna review that aggressively and we will have more to say. We're in process on that. We'll have more to say about that hopefully fairly soon. Uh, it is a somewhat complex issue uh, as bankruptcy always is. Uh, and there's different competing considerations here, but we think that uh, there's more we can do uh, to reform that process and we are committed to doing it, uh, just as you say, for the reasons that you say. Uh, my next question is, uh, we all know that to help borrowers, the Biden administration extended the pause in, in, in repayments, interest accrual and collections through January, 2022 uh, for Ed held loans. The administration also extended these protections to all defaulted loans in the Federal Family Education Loan Program. However, there are still millions of borrowers who have not received similar protections, including those with private loans. Uh, in what ways, if any, has the direct loan program proven uh, effective in providing protection for these borrowers? So if, if we're talking, are we talking about what the secretary just announced recently about public service loan forgiveness? That's correct. Uh, Okay, it, it was an important announcement, really a dramatic announcement that uh, reflected a lot of hard work that people did uh, to try to figure out what the flaws had been in the public service loan forgiveness program. Sometimes flaws that were made worse because servicers in the past may have given people wrong information or people had been confused about whether they had the right to do this or that. And it frustrated a lot of people and it, and it caused a lot of people to be denied or discouraged from pursuing uh, relief. Uh, the measures that the secretary announced uh, earlier this month are game changing for a lot of those people. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's going to make a huge difference. There's an awful lot of work to do to make that announcement into reality. We are going to work to do that. And I believe it will bring relief to hundreds of thousands of people uh, who deserve this. Again, who are we talking about? We're talking about people who serve this country in uniform. We're talking about police officers and firefighters, people very much affected by the pandemic uh, who, who need to get what's, what's what they deserve uh, under the law and under the, under the program. Uh, and we're gonna make sure that that happens, but it's, it's an awful lot of work that our team is gonna have to do at FSA. Uh, I'm confident that they will do it. They are high performers. They haven't complained about the new burdens that this puts on them because we all understand it's an opportunity to bring important relief uh, and progress to the American people. Uh, and what the secretary said is what we're going to do. Uh, and we think that it's, uh, it's a very, very good direction to go and we're gonna do the hard work of making it happen. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield, yield back. Thank you so much. And now uh, we'll hear from Ms. Miller Meeks of Iowa. Welcome. I see you walking. Ms. Miller Meeks. Some technical difficulty with Miss Miller Meeks. She has frozen. She is frozen. <laughs> I will go on to uh, Miss Hoshbarger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Cordray, I do have a question for you. Um, on March 30th, the FSA announced a program to somehow undefault some bars who defaulted during the pandemic. Now, it's pretty clear that probably isn't the law, but setting that aside, you know, I'm also concerned that it's seven months later and that still hasn't uh, happened, which clearly shows there wasn't even a plan in place in order to achieve that initially. So did somebody just hit the send on the press release before they had a plan in place, I guess is my question. And I suppose I'm concerned that not only has the department demonstrated its willingness to ignore the law, but it also doesn't even appear to have a plan on how it's going to ignore the law. So does FSA now just write press releases and then hopes and praise it's all going to work out in the end is my question. And, and that 
begs to say that birds are just going to sit in limbo for months. So what's the process for this, sir? So if the question is, does FSA write press releases without thinking about the actual mechanics of carrying out these programs, the answer is no, we don't do that. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, I'd be happy to have you frame your question again as to what exactly you would like me to address here in terms of where you're dissatisfied with, with uh, what oh, we made. Do they about. have a program? Do they have the mechanics of a program where people who have defaulted on their loans can somehow uh, undefault on those loans? I guess it's my question. Okay, so, so I'm not quite sure. There could be a variety of things you're referring to. Uh, there were people who... Uh, had fell loans at the beginning of the payment pause that were at that time not covered by the payment pause, and later the payment pause was extended to them. And therefore, we had to go to the uh, guarantee agencies and the lenders and uh, any of them who had defaulted in the meantime uh, needed to be put back in the position they would have been had the pause applied to them. If interest had been collected and it was supposed to now be 0%, that needed to be changed. And there's been a lot of work to do to make that happen. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure beyond that what you're what you're getting at, but I'd be happy to hear more and try to be well, more responsive. I'll try to rephrase the question and I'll submit okay. that to you, sir. And what I would like to do with the balance of my time is just yield that to the ranking member, Dr. Fox. Okay. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Harshberger. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about borrower defense. Mr. Cordry, exactly how many borrower defense applications are still pending adjudications? And if you don't know the exact number, we'll expect to get an answer tomorrow. Uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll be happy to give you exact numbers. What I know is uh, coming into, uh, when I came into this position, there was a very, very high number of borrower defense claims that had not been adjudicated and they had okay. piled up frankly over the past two years. Okay. Well you can uh, give I, us that you can give us that information in the response that you and, give and, us. No, but I'll be happy to do you want me to give you a little more answer here or do you want me to just go on to something else? Well let me let me uh, let me tell you the questions I'd like to have answered. Okay, How many sure. claims have been adjudicated since the beginning of the Biden administration? How many claims have been filed since the beginning of the uh, Biden administration? Have you set a timeline or goals for how quickly you'll clear the backlog? That's one you might be able to answer. That, that, that's fine. And by the way, we'll be happy to give you detailed uh, re responses that are that give you more exact numbers. But I will say uh, there have been hundreds of thousands of claims piled up uh, and we are working down the backlog. However, every time we make a new announcement about some kind of uh, school that's closed or some kind of loan forgiveness, it, it tends to... Uh, make more people apply. Uh, and so this goes up and down with a variety of circumstances. But happy to give you exact numbers in response to exact questions from you. And then we won't be jousting about okay. fuzzy particulars here. Okay. Well, we'd like to know why it's taking so long for you all to get through it. You've just indicated that's part of the problem. I haven't heard much about schools closing recently. So that's news to me. Um, well, we had, we had several closed just, just recently, uh, uh, CE schools uh, and VISTA schools uh, that really failed uh, you, me, and borrowers and taxpayers all over the country uh, didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they've now closed and left everybody high and dry. That's bad performance, okay. but that does happen. Okay. Well, we know from Secretary Cardona's um, statement when he spoke to us that people have waited a long time and they want to work swiftly. Um, but shouldn't your announcement from August 24 stating you'd grant 100% relief make this process go more quickly? And why did you stop updating the data center with information on borrower defense claims, something the previous administration did monthly? So uh, we haven't stopped the data center, although I will say these hearings have a salutary action forcing uh, effect. Uh, and we updated the data center uh, yesterday for the most recent quarter. We expect and plan, and I think my understanding is that the data center is to be updated quarterly and it will be updated quarterly on my watch. Uh, I can tell you that when I came in, we were about six months behind and we're catching up now uh, and we will keep you posted on that. In terms of borrower defense claims, you know, sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes they're one by one type claims 
uh, and those those are those are hard to administer in an effective way. But that's something we're thinking through. As you say, 100% relief will simplify the process somewhat. It's still not a simple process. It's complex in various ways. Uh, but we're we're continuing to work on it. We'll be glad to give you progress reports on how that's going. Well, frankly, I'm glad to hear you say that they're very complicated, but that because that's what the previous administration said, and it was condemned when it said that. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I apologize for going over. Thank you so much. And uh, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Cordray has a, another homework assignment or if he cleared that up in the amount of time that you had. I, I, think, I think I do have another homework assignment. I did want to say to Representative Fox, I missed my chance earlier. Congratulations. I saw that your old school had a big win on the football field last week. So I'm sure that your South Carolina colleagues are feeling your your uh, your. Uh, uh, overlordship of them for the time being. So, thank you, thank you so much, Representative Cheryl, New Jersey, still with us. Thank you. How are you? Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Mr. Cordray. This committee has examined the harm that unscrupulous for-profit colleges have inflicted on students, many of whom are students of color, first-generation students, and student veterans. About two weeks ago, I met with the American Legion representatives in my district, including the county commander of Morris County. They specifically brought up how concerned they were about predatory lending. They're concerned about how for-profit schools are targeting veterans because of their GI benefits. And we know that one way the VA has attempted to combat bad actors from taking advantage of our veterans is through the GI Bill comparison tool which tracks complaints and FTC settlements against bad actor for-profit institutions. But this is only one tool designed to help one targeted group. Can you please explain how the federal government and states can better work together to effectively monitor and oversee these institutions? Thank you, it's a great question. And by the way, the example you gave, which I know is near to your heart of, of service members in particular, is a very important constituency. And if there were one that we were going to pick out as a priority, uh, that certainly would, would have a, one of the best cases to make. And I'm glad to see that some of that has gotten itself in place. And we are doing data matches with DOD now. That's something that we can do. Uh, and we're getting uh, much more relief to more people. And we wanna get relief to everyone frankly, who deserves it. In, in general, though, to your question, uh, we can work together with state officials. We want to work together with state officials. Uh, under prior policy of the prior administration, they blocked uh, the department and the FSA from working with state officials. And frankly, it led to, what did it lead to? State officials suing the federal government just to get information they thought they needed to oversee these programs. Uh, that's not the way we should be working together, and we have stopped that. Going forward, uh, where we have complaints, by the way, states will hear from people, we will hear from people, the FTC will hear from people, we need to bring all this together, uh, CFPB as well, uh, and, and talk together and think together about how to solve these problems. That's what we will do, and I think we'll be more effective as a result. Uh, and in terms of how we will uh, address these issues. It'll be a variety of different means. Sometimes it'll be data matching. Sometimes it will be going after high-risk uh, operators that we think are, are letting, letting people down. Uh, sometimes it will be other things, but, uh, but we will work closely with our state partners uh, on this rather than pushing them away. Uh, and I think that's the right answer. Thank you. And you went over some of um, what you're going to do with the state actors. Are, are there other actions the FSA is taking or planning to take to improve the oversight of the for-profit sector? Yes. And again, uh, you know, some people would say we're targeting the for-profit sector. We're not. We are targeting any schools that are not performing as they should, that are violating the law, that are, that are abusing and mistreating students and borrowers and their families. Uh, whoever those are, that's who we're going to go after. And we will, and we need to. And, and people need to see that we're doing that so that the other schools get the message and shape up. That's the way law enforcement works. It has a deterrent effect. And that deterrent effect is important because it brings more people into line. We're going to be working with the Federal Trade Commission. They've signed up uh, to work with us and, and they will be a very effective partner. They have 100 years of history. Uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, they're eager to, to take on uh, schools that are violating the law. Uh, we will work with them in a strategic way. Uh, we will work with states where that's appropriate. 
uh, we will work with the CFPB where that's appropriate uh, and, and the Justice Department. So that, that's how we plan to proceed here. I don't know if I quite answered your question. If I didn't, feel free to renew it. No, I appreciate that. And I think that is a good flag where, you know, my specific concerns are those bad actors that have been um, really uh, taking advantage of some of our students. You know, Finally, just wanted to ask, the American Rescue Plan included a historic provision to close the 90-10 loophole. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually going to re- go there in response to your last question, but uh, for, I, I no, was going to add no, I'll go the there. Talk, and that's where you went. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll go yeah, there. Sorry. I'll go there. Yeah. Um, and so as a result of the closure of the loophole, for-profit institutions will be required to derive not less than 10% of revenue from funds other than federal education assistance funds, and now including the GI Bill, which I think is important. So this will protect the integrity of the $120 billion spent on federal financial aid every year and guard against a waste of taxpayer dollars. The 9010 rule also helps ensure that federal resources are not funneled to institutions that are fully reliant on taxpayer funded programs for financial viability. So now that the department's beginning the negotiations to close the loophole, the 9010 rule will protect veterans and service members who until recently, as I mentioned and we were just discussing, have been targets of predatory recruiting practices by low quality providers. So since the closure of the loophole will start applying to institution, institutions fis- um, to fiscal years beginning on or after January 1st, 2023, what steps can FSA take in the interim to better enforce that rule? So, for example, are you considering additional consequences for institutions that fail the 9010 rule in the first year as part of a provisional program participation agreement? Yeah, we, we will do whatever we can to help bridge the gap between now and when that law takes effect. I will just say I wrote a book about my time at CFPB. The 9010 loophole was one of the frustrations that we experienced, and I, and I talked about it in my book. And in, in, in the end, you all have now fixed that. Thank goodness, good work by the Congress there. In the meantime, if there's things we can do, and I don't know what they all may be, uh, to try to in, enforce that, uh, even though it's not yet law, uh, we'll, we'll try to protect uh, taxpayers on that. But it was a terrible loophole that people were driving a truck through and it was, it was hurting us. And, and I appreciate the Congress stepping up and fixing that. That, that was good work. Well, thank you. I'm not sure Congress gets too many attaboys, so thank you so much. And with that, I will yield back, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you so much. Ms. Miller Meeks, uh, you're now ready? Good, welcome. Uh, uh, Yes, ma'am, I'm ready. Thank you. I'll try not to go over my time. So Mr. Cordray, as of April 2020, nearly 1.3 million borrowers had their employment certified by the department and we're on track to receive public service loan forgiveness. My Democrat colleagues would like to say that this program is a way to reward first responders and frontline workers for their dedication to public service. But according to FSA data, the average balance forgiven as of April, 2020 was approximately $83,000. And let me say that I am a 24 year military veteran. So uh, I have no issues and have used the GI Bill uh, and uh, have also uh, instructed people about joining the military uh, when they're in the healthcare fields, utilizing loan forgiveness. But these statistics suggest that graduate degree holders are the vast majority of beneficiaries under this program. Now, we certainly want American workers to be educated and to be competitive in the workforce, but this highlights a real concern where the statute is drafted so broadly that public service employees currently account for 25% of the US workforce. Do you have any indication as to what share of the PSLF population work in an authentic uh, actual public service like uh, teaching or being a first responder or doctors at a tribal healthcare setting or a free medical clinic rather than their own clinic or a not-for-profit that still uh, is um, highly uh, successful? Yeah, and if I, if I may, let me say several things. First of all, I appreciate the point you made early on, which is, as you say, you, you made use of the GI Bill. You know the transformational effect that can have on your life, you, you, in your own life. And it's the same is true for many of your colleagues around the country. Uh, so we want to make sure that people who are entitled to public service loan forgiveness actually get that, and we follow through on that promise that was made to them in the law. At the same time, as you note, We don't want anybody to be taking advantage of that program who doesn't really deserve 
public service loan forgiveness. And so one of the things we do at FSA is we have to determine employer eligibility in any kind of doubtful close call. Uh, and we will make those calls uh, and we will make them you know, faithfully to the intent of the law. Anybody who's working for the government is entitled to public service loan relief. And as you said- Okay, so I sir, thank you for that. I had asked what share of the population. Uh, let me go to my next question. Do you believe that a researcher at the Brookings Institution is doing public service? I, it may depend on exactly what the nature of the job is. I would say generally, uh, I would think no, but- uh, I, okay. What about a researcher? What about a researcher at the Heritage Foundation? Again, generally, I would say no, but that maybe there could, they could make a particular case. I'd have to see the case to be persuaded by it, but in general- Do you believe that Turning Point USA, a 501c3, performs a public service? Look, I don't, I'm not familiar with that organization, so I can't really okay. speak What about it. Planned Parenthood? It's a 501c3. Do you believe that taxpayers should be shouldering the cost to forgive the loans of a uh, Planned Parenthood employee? Again, and, and you know, as to all the groups you stated, not specifically to any one of them, there are certain jobs that depending on what people actually do, it may be that the bulk of their time is devoted to actual public service. Uh, but if it's not, then they should not get the relief. And that's, that's generally how we would approach these issues. So having left home as 16 as the fourth of eight children, uh, I've served as a nurse and a physician in the United States Army the former director of the Iowa Department of Public Health, a state senator, and now a U.S. congresswoman. I am not against public service, uh, obviously, I'm and I am not. not against the PSLF, but I am concerned that the eligibility for the program is so vast and so broad that we are using a program intended um, to incentivize public service on industries and jobs that ultimately do not fit that definition can your office commit to providing this committee a breakdown of the PSLF borrowers by occupation and by undergraduate and graduate degree? We'd be glad to, if you follow up with the specific data request, and I guess you just made one, and we'll try to take it down, but if you wanna convey it in writing so we have the exact particulars, we'll make sure we get the answer right. Uh, we'll provide you with whatever information we have. And by the way, it's a fair point you raise. Public service loan forgiveness should go to people doing public service. It should not go to people pretending to do public service who are really doing something else. And we'll be glad to try to ferret out anybody who's trying to take advantage of the program. Uh, at the same time, these are very situational instances that we have to deal with case by case sometimes. Uh, although, as I say, everything you described in your background, every bit of that would qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And I hope that uh, you fared reasonably well through the GI Bill and others because you deserve it. Well, well, thank you for that. And I certainly have, as I said, made a request. I hope that you'll fulfill the request. Uh, and I hope that the uh, information will get to us as soon as possible, hopefully no later than Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. I yield back my time, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Miller Meeks. And we look forward to uh, the response because all of us are interested in your question. In fact, I have a bill that I'm crafting on uh, public service uh, to look at that also. So thank you. Uh, now, uh, Mr. K Representative Castro has joined us. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. And thank you, Mr. Cadre, for coming before this committee to discuss these issues relating to federal student aid. Uh, under the public service loan forgiveness, borrowers who have made 10 years of payments while working certain public service jobs would have their federal student loan balances forgiven in full, as you know. But in 2019, the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO, reported that it reported the Department of Education had denied 99% of public service loan forgiveness applications. And many public, service, public servants were rejected because they received misinformation from their servicer or were enrolled in the wrong payment plan, among other issues. Uh, the Department of Education recently shared new data about federal student aid programs, including a new report on the PSLF program demonstrating that most borrowers are not yet eligible for forgiveness because they've not been in repayment for 10 years. However, for many of those borrowers, this is due to the fact that they had the wrong type of loan and as a result had to consolidate into the direct loan program, which caused their repayment clock to reset and increase their time to reach forgiveness. The federal student aid has recently announced a limited waiver to help borrowers 
access for gymnasts through the PSLF program. So I wanted to ask you, uh, moving forward, how will the FSA ensure that loan services are equipped to help borrowers access PSLF both during the time-limited waiver and into the future, especially given the upcoming return to payment? Thank you. It's, it's a good question. And, and I don't mean to refer to my book again, but again, at CFPB, uh, the book I wrote, Watchdog, is about some of the failures that I saw that I wished we could have corrected that we didn't. The 90-10 rule was one. The PSLF program was another, as you described. Very, very few people over the years have gotten any relief under that program. I think it was just a few thousand at the beginning of this year. Uh, the changes that are being made here uh, that the secretary announced and, and due to a lot of hard work by people at the department and at FSA uh, are going to result in the numbers of, of people receiving public service loan forgiveness before the end of this year will be into the tens of thousands and, and, and a multiple of four or five over what was done uh, before. And we're on the road to hundreds of thousands of others getting their, their monthly count of how many qualifying months uh, boosted forward and the relief being made easier for them. Uh, those are all things that we're going to do. Now, having said that, that was an announcement. There's a lot of hard work that follows on an announcement that has to be done to make it effective. You know that. You, you know government very well. Uh, it, it's our job to do that. We have to work with our servicer uh, in this case, it's FIA. There are loan forgiveness, uh, public service loan forgiveness servicer. That'll be transitioning at some point, but uh, they work on this program. They do hard work every day to try to deliver this relief. We're going to be uh, overseeing that to make sure that that's happening, uh, and we're going to be working closely together. Uh, I want to see this succeed. The secretary wants to see this succeed. I think all of us want to see this succeed, that people who deserve forgiveness based on many years of public service are getting their payment counts proper, they're getting their relief after 10 years, uh, and this, this program will finally deliver uh, what it was supposed to deliver. That, that's, that's our job here and we're gonna do it. And can I ask you, what were the consequences of any to the servicers or others involved in administering this program and the fact that 99% of applicants were rejected and the program was not working as it was intended? So I can't speak to what may have happened before I, I came here, uh, but uh, what I will say is uh, there, are, there are some who are rejected outright. There are many who are not rejected, but they're, put, they're told that they're on their path to it. They may not be nearly as far along that path as they thought they were, and there's been a lot of frustration about that too. Uh, the changes the secretary announced, which are significant, put people much farther forward toward 10 years, pushed at least... 20,000 and, 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 and actually close to 50,000 with, with a few uh, uh, further changes uh, past 10 years and, and deserving now and entitled to full relief and they'll get it. Uh, and there are hundreds of thousands who've had their payment count advanced, you know, many, many months in some cases. And if they consolidate their loans, which is the step they need to take uh, if they're fell borrowers, uh, they, they may actually go all the way from nothing to full forgiveness. So we're encouraging everyone to do that. We'd sure. like you to help us encourage everyone to do let me, that. Let me just make one more point. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I, I just want to be sure that there was no, um, that there wasn't there was some malfeasance there, uh, that somebody wasn't trying to make money off of a scheme. Yeah, um, yeah actually, let, I'll tell you, say two more things, if I may. Number one, we are concerned about that. And that's why one of the pieces that the secretary announced is a redetermination program for people who might have applied before and been rejected, uh, that they can reapply and that they should seek reconsideration. So we want to correct those errors where possible. The other is there are scams and frauds that develop around these programs. It's true of everything in government. There's something we're doing that's good for people. There are scammers and fraudsters who will try to get into it, use it as a way to get people's personal information and so forth. We try to fight that as much as we can, uh, but in terms of the actual program, uh, we will give people a chance to have reconsideration here. I have to yield here. back, and the chairwoman's cutting me off here. I yield back, chairwoman. Yes. <laughs> this is a very, very interesting meeting, so you can see why we keep going over time, because uh, <laughs> every, so many questions and so many concerns. I told you before the meeting started how impactful this was going to be, but we appreciate your cooperation. Yes, I don't you, you, you warned me very, very clearly, yes. <laughs> I don't know um, if Mr. Castro uh, wants anything in writing. 
you, you're fine with your responses. But yes, if there's anything else in writing, if you could, uh, anything else left to answer on those questions, if you could put them in writing. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. Uh, and next, uh, Representative Comer of Kentucky. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Cordray, I'm sure you're very aware that Ranking Member Fox and I, along with several of our colleagues on the House Oversight Committee, sent a letter to Secretary uh, Cardona in July requesting the release of a report commissioned by former Secretary DeVos detailing budget projections and information related to the value of the federal government's entire student loan portfolio. This letter followed several requests. So we invoked the statutory seven member rule requiring executive branch agencies to produce documents when seven members from the oversight committee make the request. Now, this seven member rule has just started this year. This was uh, uh, the result of a lawsuit by Elijah Cummings and the minority, at that time, the minority Democrats on the oversight committee because they were having difficulty getting information from the Trump administration. So now there's a process for the minority to get documentation from the executive branch if they refuse to comply with our request. And it's called the seven member rule. We invoked the seven member rule. We've only done that a couple of times this Congress. Yet the Department of Education refused to respond with appropriate documents. So we went and we sent another follow-up letter two weeks ago. Again, I have received no response from the department. Now, Mr. Cordray, this information will be very useful in determining the scope of student loan debt we're discussing in this hearing today and the debt American students are living with every day. I encourage you to work with your colleagues to provide this information to the oversight committee as soon as possible. And I might remind you that uh, ranking member Fox is also a uh, very active member on the House Oversight Committee. So is that a reasonable request? So, I, and, and again, uh, ranking member Fox asked me about that same report, I believe earlier in the hearing. Uh, and I'll, I'll simply uh, give you the same answer I gave her, which is what I know on the subject, uh, which is that, uh, and by, by the way, if you haven't received a response on that, I believe one is forthcoming, you should get it immediately. And again, these hearings do have a way of kind of pushing forward the work for us. It's just the nature of life, I guess. But let me just say, uh, what I understand is that the report had been provided in a redacted form. The redactions were uh, imposed by the previous administration. Uh, it's been looked at and it's thought that that was again, the appropriate response. And I think it's, it's again being provided in the same redacted form. Uh, and it, and there's some concern about some of the metrics in that report uh, that we think are not accurate. Uh, and, and we're offering, the department is offering to provide a briefing to everybody who's interested in the subject of that report to go through it in some detail. And if that's helpful to you, it might be worth doing that and then see if you're satisfied. And if you're not, you could follow up at that point. But I think that's, that's what... Uh, what would be a responsive to your you know, when, you, when you when you ask any member of Congress, whether they're Republican or Democrats, and there's a big difference between the Republicans and Democrats from an ideological standpoint up here. And I think every American sees that. If you say name the 20, 25 biggest issues that affect people in your district, student loan debt is, is going to be in just about every member's list of 25 issues. And it shouldn't be this hard to get information uh, to help us determine the extent of the student loan debt. And uh, it's just, it's been a frustrating process. I, I hope that, uh, I hope that from this point on, the Department of Education will comply with the House Oversight Committee's simple request for information. Uh, well, now, let, me switch, let, me, let me switch gears and sure. say, uh, recently the Department of Education began the negotiated rulemaking process to make changes once again to the borrower defense regulations. Uh, in a highly irregular move, the department announced that it planned to retroactively change the, bio, the borrower defense rules for all federal student loans, thus applying the new regulation to borrowers whose claims have already been uh, adjudicated. Uh, retroactively in law is, is highly disfavored. The and Supreme Court president is quite clear that rules should not be retroactive unless authorized explicitly by Congress. 
The Biden administration's proposal runs counter to this settled area of the law on retroactivity without an authorization evident in the Higher Education Act, permitting the department to establish retroactive rules, even though Obama administration's borrower defense rule did not attempt to make such an extraordinary change. Mr. Corday, if the HEA does not authorize such actions, what authority does the department have to make retroactive changes to the borrower defense regulations? Boy, I got about five seconds and that's about a 10 minute answer I need to give you. So I don't know if you're gonna need that one in writing or just what, but what I'll say is, I know the borrower defense program is very complicated. There have been three or four changes of direction uh, by different either rulemakings or policy differences under the prior administrations. Uh, one of the things we, I know is that that's one of the issues that's gonna be taken up in negotiated rulemaking process, which will be a very public process the department's undertaking. Uh, I'm not running that process, but we have input into it. Everybody will have input into it. We're happy to have your input into it and get that rule into the right uh, position. And we'll work to do that. In general though, uh, in terms of the zig and zag in this that there has been in the past, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, we could give you chapter and verse on that, but probably be better to do that in writing if, if, you, if you will. Uh, I'll look forward to receiving that. Thank you. <laughs> More homework. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Courtney, how are you, Connecticut? I'm good. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, and thank you, Mr. Cordray, for being here today. Uh, I agree with your earlier testimony that Secretary Cardona's decision on October 6th to untangle the public service loan uh, program is a very significant and powerful decision that will help hundreds of thousands of student loan borrowers. I think probably every member got frustrated constituents calling over the last three years uh, about the fact that the uh, Department of Education and the loan servicers were just, um, you know, really arbitrarily denying their 10 years of hard work in terms of complying with the program. I was uh, here back in 2007 when the College Cost Reduction Act was passed that created the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. I think it's important to remember it had strong bipartisan support and was signed into law by George W. Bush. Um, so, you know, again, I think if there's a consensus area in terms of student loan relief, uh, certainly people who, um, you know, either wear the uniform of this country or step up as cops or teachers, nurses, et cetera, in, in public service jobs um, who are earning uh, their discharge is something that we should all pull together and work hard to, to implement. Um, particularly, I, I wanna just, again, note that, um, you know, we're already hearing from constituents that uh, have gotten the good news in terms of emails from the department. Uh, so it's happening in real time, you know, where people are getting the good news that uh, payments are being recognized and moving up their, their discharge date. Uh, the fact that, um, again, people who are in the military um, are also going to have their um, time overseas uh, counted under, you know, deferred the deferred payments that um, uh, occurred when they're overseas are going to be counted as qualifying payments. Uh, again, just want to confirm that that's something that's going to be implemented by the Department of Education in conjunction with DOD. So it's really going to be done um, internally uh, as a, in terms of a, a, an administrative function. Is that correct? Yeah, we have worked hard to get automated, automated data matching with DOD. And by the way, we're trying to get it across the federal government through Office of Personnel Management. We think we will. It takes a little time to do some of these things. But yes, we're going to make it as easy as possible. Uh, and we also would like to work with states and local governments as well. And maybe you and, and your staffs could help us uh, with that on some outreach on that and so forth. We want everybody who's entitled to the benefits of this uh, under the law to get the benefits of this. And by the way, uh, there, every day I work with people here at FSA and the department, they're all public servants too, as you know, I'm really proud of the work they're doing. Uh, some days you're especially proud because really good work has gotten done. And the day of that announcement about public service loan forgiveness was a day I was especially proud of the people at FSA. And sure. So, you know, and again, just on that point, um, you know, this committee reported out as part of the Build Back Better Act, a provision to clean up the, the problem with the uh, military service members. Uh, again, the, the secretary's order kind of obviated the need to include that into the BBB when we do final passage. I want to, again, thank your staff who helped work with uh, committee staff in terms of fashioning the language. And um, again, clearly the commitment was there uh, within your, your agency. The other um, part of uh, the secretary's order, just I have a question. I just really important. I just want to get through this 
Mr. Sec, um, is that you know some people, as uh, Congressman Castro alluded, are going to actually have to file a waiver request to get the consolidation relief, which uh, the secretary's order uh, included. Um, and you know we're already hearing from constituents that servicers who are getting calls because I mean this is something people are watching like a hawk, you know, back home. Um, are already um, being told they're not, they don't have the guidance to implement the PSLF changes. Um, and again, we want uh, to make sure because there's a deadline here of October of next year for people to file these requests, what steps FSA is gonna take. Uh, we wanna be partners with you to get the word out to people in terms of making sure that, you know, they don't get caught in another sort of bureaucratic gymnastic that would uh, affect their uh, eligibility for discharge. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fair question. And, uh, and by the way, we're operating in real time here. It's been a matter of days since the Secretary's announcement. And we want to make sure that people have the right guidance here. Uh, and, you know, sometimes quick is the enemy of the good. Uh, but we're working on that. We will work with the servicer, which is FIA, uh, to make sure that they have the guidance to provide to people. We've heard some of the same things you've heard. Uh, and we want to get these things sorted out as quickly as possible. Uh, but we do intend and we will uh, deliver on the announcement that was made uh, and get relief to people. And we will communicate closely with them going forward. Uh, and by the way, to the extent you hear things, pass them on to us because we're probably hearing the same things, but if we aren't, we wanna hear from you too, okay? So when you have a, a form developed for the waiver application, I mean, please share that with member offices because that's obviously, that's the tangible document that is gonna trigger um, relief for, for folks. And, and again, definitely wanna work with you. One last point. Uh, Mr. Pukan talked about the refinance uh, issue. Uh, again, I've introduced a bill uh, to actually uh, track the uh, Federal Reserve benchmark um, and, and allow people to refinance down. So uh, there already is something actively in the hopper, um, you know, with this Congress, the 117th Congress to go that route and look forward to hopefully working with the secretary in your office to, to you know, provide something, you know, that is screamingly obvious, which is that people should be able to refinance their debt with student loans, just like you do with a home mortgage or uh, other forms of consumer debt. I understand your point on that and whatever you do, we will be glad to implement. Thank, Thank you, sir. I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative uh, Letlow. Thank you. And Mr. Cordray, thank you for taking the time to testify before the committee today. As you know, the pandemic brought on many challenges, especially for students and borrowers. So Congress provided a temporary pause on federal student loan repayments. The CARES Act provided the Secretary of Education Authority to suspend all interest accumulation and monthly payments on federally held loans through September 30th, 2020. Additional executive action extended the repayment paused by the previous and current administrations. However, most recently, the Biden administration has extended repayment one final time until January 31st, 2022. Unfortunately, to date, neither the department nor FSA has made public a comprehensive plan for returning borrowers into repayment status. The repayment date is just around the corner, and this lack of clarity is unhelpful to the 45 million borrowers. These individuals need to have an explicit understanding on all requirements and expectations when the payment suspensions end. In fact, law requires borrowers to receive no less than six notices when normal payment obligations are about to resume. Additionally, this uncertainty has made it difficult for loan collection agencies to have adequate time to plan and hire employees. As many businesses, these agencies had to let people go during the pandemic. Now, loan collection agencies will be expected to resume their business as usual and meet the same collection requirements for the department as soon as repayment begins again. These agencies need time to ensure they have employees hired and trained so they can deliver on the department's and borrower's expectations. Mr. Cordray, loan rehabilitation has been a key tool to assist borrowers. In fact, Congress recognized the value of this tool and it was included as a provision in the CARES Act. Why did FCA, FSA decide that private collection agencies should not proactively explain the benefits of loan rehab to borrowers? So I think you have accurately and admirably described the challenges here uh, of the multiple extensions of the repayment pause uh, and now the moving to a final uh, deadline. 
And what I'll say is in, in terms of a communications plan, we have extensive communications plans that we're already activating and operating under. We have been for the last couple of months. Now that we know this is the final deadline, we're reaching out to tens of millions of borrowers here uh, and they will get the required, as you, as you noted correctly, at least six communications from us on this subject. Uh, and that, that's what Congress said we should do. And it will be more than six in many cases. Uh, some of those communications are coming directly from us. Some of them will be coming from their servicers. We will have input into what those communications are just to make sure the message isn't getting mixed here. We're also working and we'd be awfully glad to work with you and your offices to make sure the message gets out that way as well. That's another way we can reach people. Look, some of them will listen to FSA. Some of them may listen to their servicer. Some of them will listen to neither of those, but they will listen to you. Uh, you know, your voice is respected in your community and other, other community groups and, and others, whether it's alumni associations or student associations or teachers associations or anybody can help us get this message out. We don't want anybody to mistake this, fall into delinquency and default because they just didn't understand this was happening. They just didn't hear about it. Uh, our job is to get this a blanket communication across the country, but all of you can help us do that and we would appreciate it. Now I can go into more detail on more plans. Well, I have, I have one follow-up to that. Yeah, I appreciate sure. that. Um, sure. uh, I'd like to follow up. There are 11 private collection agencies, PCAs on contract with the department. And it's my understanding the PCAs are at the ready to assist borrowers with rehabilitation when return to loan payment repayment begins. Will FSA allow PCAs to begin calls to defaulted borrowers on February 1, 2022? So in, in terms of uh, what, what's going to happen uh, with defaulted borrowers, there are active consideration, active consideration being given to that. Uh, there's various schools of thought as to what the pandemic pause has meant for defaulted borrowers. Uh, as you know, the PCAs that you're talking about have not been able to engage in collection activity for the most part during the payment pause because there's been no debt to collect because it's all been paused, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been a difficult situation for them, we understand. Uh, and coming out of this, depending on decisions that are made uh, about uh, after January 31st, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. We will communicate with people as we can, uh, that is the PCAs, uh, and we want to make sure we have plenty of capacity for reaching borrowers to make sure that they get this message and that they don't misunderstand it or fail to hear it. So I agree with you. That's a prime consideration for us, and we're working hard to do that. Thank you, Mr. Cordray. I yield back. Thank you so much. And now, um, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici, for being here. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Cordray. I agree with my colleagues who have noted the importance of this issue. A recent estimate from the Federal Reserve found that Americans owe more than $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. And in my home state of Oregon, the average graduate has more than $27,000 in debt. So it's clear we need to work together to find the best policies to support student borrowers. So Mr. Cordray, we know of the three uh, loan servicers that have announced, announced that they do not plan to renew their contracts. We've talked about that. Navian, Granite State Management, FedLoan. These three companies serve about 16 million borrowers. So I wanna ask about how the non-renewal of these contracts is gonna affect borrowers and their families. So how will the department let borrowers know if their service is changing? And how can Congress help you make this transition as easy and cost-effective as possible for borrowers, their families, and for taxpayers? Yeah, thank you for the question. And the numbers you cited, I believe, are, are pretty much accurate. Uh, you know, in fact, are accurate. Uh, what I will say is there have been times in the past, as I understand it, and it's histor history for me, uh, I'm new to the job, uh, that FSA hasn't always handled transfer of accounts well and the servicers haven't transferred the accounts well, and there've been problems for borrowers. Uh, more recently, uh, and most of the more recent examples have been smaller uh, universes of borrowers, uh, but those have been handled better and the communication plans are sounder and the handoff is better. And by the way, here at the handoffs are being overseen very closely and the servicers know that uh, by a co coalition of overseers, including FSA, CFPB and 17 states. So that gives me more confidence. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we need to make this work. The way we do it is we start by transferring a small cohort of borrowers 
and make sure that we work the kinks out on that. Then we gradually move to larger cohorts of borrowers. That is well in process right now for the Granite State portfolio. Uh, the Navient portfolio is gonna be handled, we think more easily because it's, it's a move directly from one servicer to another of the entire accounts all on the same platform. But we'll, we'll see and we'll make sure that that's done well. The FIA uh, transfers are a little more complex because they're so big, they have to go to multiple recipient servers not everybody on the same platform. So we will be bulldogging that to make sure uh, that that goes as well as we can. Uh, Thank and you. And I want to get to another issue, yeah. but I know we'll be following up on that to see how okay. it's going sure. throughout the process. Fair so so the, the Department of Education recently moved to provide targeted forms of loan relief, including uh, people with total or permanent disability, those discharges to borrowers without requiring them to, to go through the process. And I've been a longtime supporter of helping borrowers with permanent disability. And in fact, I included some protections in my SIMPLE Act, uh, which uh, will work to get more borrowers into income-driven repayment plans by automating the annual process of recertifying a borrower's income. Uh, this uh, similar provisions to this uh, SIMPLE Act are included in the Future Act, which as you know, was signed into law last Congress, and even though income-driven repayment is, is, is not a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's a very effective tool. So how can automatic processes uh, remove major barriers for borrowers and get them the benefits they're entitled to under the law? And are there additional programs, including automatically updating income, or, uh, income for borrowers on IDR plans that you would like to see automated in a similar way that will help streamline the process? So excellent question. And I would say significant work in progress on, on all of the fronts you mentioned. Number one, the total and permanent disability announcement recently, that is vastly being automated uh, and the relief is being delivered to people. And it's significant numbers of people, as you said, several hundred thousand people. So that's an example of how we're starting to do this work better. The IRS relationship with FSA has, has really uh, made progress uh, over the last year or so, uh, and they, there are ways that they can help us automate some of this, including, as you say, income-driven repayment. We want that to be as easy as possible for borrowers. Frankly, every borrower of student loans who is now repaying student loans, we want them to, as much as possible in one of two plans, either on an auto debit, if they're able to stay current and able to make those payments so they don't forget, they don't screw up, it's just regular routine, you know, the way you automatically debit an account for an expected amount, no surprises. That's what we want. And we're pushing people to make sure that they get in that as much as possible. If they're having trouble making their payments or if they're going to struggle to make their payments, we want them to be on income driven repayment. That's the right answer. It allows them to lower their monthly payment to an appropriate amount. Uh, and then going forward, we can continue to adjust it to their circumstances year in, year out. That's a big, big deal for us. We're trying to make that simpler for people. Uh, and we want everybody out there and, and help us spread the word among your constituents. If you're able to make your payments easily, get on auto debit. If you're having trouble making payments, get on income driven repayment and the process should be easier now than it was before. Uh, and, and don't take no for an answer on that. I, I appreciate that. And when we were working on the Simple Act, and this is over the last several years, we found that there were many students who just did not meet that strict deadline uh, on updating their income uh, payment. And, and then they'd be in default and then it was harder to get them out. So streamlining that process and automating it, I think has been a, a tremendous help. As I yield back, Madam Chair, I do wanna uh, align myself with the colleagues who have asked about uh, the, the challenges with the public service loan forgiveness uh, program and look forward to working with you on that. Mr. Cordray, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Keller? Welcome to our committee. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Cordray, uh, several FSA contractors have exited the federal student loan servicing industry since the beginning of this year. As a result, over 16 million borrowers will be placed with a new servicer at the same time they return to repayment status after nearly a two year pause. As you've noted, the return to repayment was challenging. It was a challenging task. Without, uh, they were asking me to where you trying. Excuse me, I heard somebody said uh, it was a challenging task, even without losing any servicers. Among the servicers that have announced their exit was the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, or FIA. This is an entity that does a tremendous work in Pennsylvania, and has received some unfair criticism from uh, congressional Democrats 
progressive advocate advocates, and sometimes, quite frankly, uh, your department. Uh, uh, you've repeatedly noted and alluded to it in your testimony that the reason some servicers made the decision not to renew or extend their contracts was that they were either unable or unwilling to meet proposed or supposed increased accountability and performance metrics. Uh, for example, speaking at a conference in September um, attended by several FSA stakeholders, you noted, not every, you noted that not everybody was thrilled with the new standards, but FSA stuck to its guns and some of the servicers decided to exit the program rather than contend with these new realities. Uh, does, does that statement or does that include FIA? So I'm, I'm not uh, trying to... Uh, uh, it, does it include FIA or doesn't? I, I've only got five minutes. Yes or no? Well, FIA is exiting our program. They have reasons of their own for exiting. They're, they have freedom of choice here. They've decided to exit. Uh, okay. However, they are a big servicer. It's going to take time to move their portfolio. They're going to have to continue to work with okay. us. Okay, you answered answer my question. Leave. I got to keep sorry. moving. I, I, I can't have a filibuster. I got to keep moving here. Uh, I'm trying to answer so, your question. So you've talked to FIA about why they decided to exit? Again, that's a yes or a no. Uh, I have had conversations with FIA's leadership since I became head of FSA. Yes. Okay. Now the, the, the contract extension for the remaining servicers, uh, these, these new guidelines, were they, were they made uh, uh, aware of that, were the servicers made aware of these new guidelines on September 24th of this year? Actually, they were made aware of those guidelines sooner because we had to negotiate the contracts and it took more than two months of hard work. Okay, so when were they made aware of the, what, what date were they made aware? It would, it would have varied with different, different ones of them, but I think my very first conversation uh, with loan servicer uh, leaders, uh, including FIA, I would have made plain that this was what we intended. Well, However, they, let me, can, I, can I say something just no, to- No, I'd just like to know what date that was. Some, can I, well, I don't know what the date that was, but it was- Can you early. get us the date? It was early. Let me say in context here, loan servicing is a hard job. I know it's a hard job. And I'll say this to you and I'll say it to FIA and I'll say it to all the loan servicers. I've seen mortgage loan servicing as head of CFPB. It's a very hard job. Having said that, we need to do a good job and we have to have performance and accountability metrics in these contracts and people have to meet them. I'm, not, not, to I'm not gonna disagree with that. I'm, I'm gonna take okay. my time back. I'm not gonna disagree with that. Okay. That we need to have transparency and we need to make sure everybody understands what they're doing and they have to provide a good job. And I know FIA does in Pennsylvania because they service all of, all of Pennsylvania. Uh, but for people to make uh, accusations that FIA is doing this because they don't want accountability is not fair. I'd like to know, and I'd like to know when you can provide me with the date you talk to FIA. When, when can I expect to have the information on when FIA was made aware of this? Well, I can give, I, look, I, I don't know exactly what the uh, situation here is on a request like this, but if you're asking for a specific question about a factual date, uh, I yeah. believe we, we can provide it. Uh, okay. And we will. Okay. I would expect, but, I would expect, look, I did not, this I, week, I, I, I did not, I would, no, I'm gonna, sir, I didn't, I, sir, I'm sure. that's fine. It's my ahead. time. Sure. I would expect that by Friday of this week, you can provide my staff or the committee with the date on which you made FIA aware of what the guidelines would be. I just like to know that. Okay. Because that goes to the timeline of when they decided or did not decide to, to, to continue the, the, the contract here. Uh, Again, it's all about accountability. And I, I've heard a lot of discussions today regarding student loans and, and, and educational institutions. In fact, the, uh, the secretary, Secretary Cordona said a couple months ago that everybody should be treated the same uh, as far as educational institutions, regardless of their tax status. I'm still waiting for his plan on holding everybody to the same metrics. Okay, but let, let, me, let, me, let, me add, let me add something that may complicate your question. You asked, when did I tell FIA something? When I first came in as head of FSA in May, on May 4th and started speaking publicly about my job, I started talking about accountability and performance. And so th that was in the air, whether I had said it directly to FIA, say on the phone, or whether I said it generally and they heard it, everybody began hearing that after I became the head of FSA. That was not a message that was hidden or somehow sugar-coated. That was part of what we expected. Well, sir, sir, here's a little bit of accountability that you and the department can provide, okay? I want to know the date when they were made aware. And I also want to see the secretary's plan. When he agreed that everybody should be treated the same, here's accountability for you guys, okay? I want to see the plan. I want to see okay. the plan to treat everybody the same from the Department of Education. 
Okay, whatever you're expecting or, or requiring or demanding, if you just put us in writing to us and we'll try to respond to you in writing, we'd be happy to do that. No, but in no terms try. Of, again, you either, do, you either do something or you don't. I okay. will submit you my requests in writing. Okay, but again, as to when FIA would have learned something, I have been talking about this from the first day on the job. They probably no, would have no, heard sir. Of those meetings. No, sir, that, that's the, let's, not, let's not dodge the question. There was a date when they were given the expectations, okay? Okay, I guess we'll Hi. leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Hi. Mr. Fitzgerald of Wisconsin, welcome to our committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Cordray, for being here. Um, this is, uh, somebody kicked the hornet's nest here. And uh, that's, I think, obvious based on the question and the back and forth that's going on today. Uh, I, I think what's been exposed by the pause is that we have a system that is uh, flawed. And uh, whether it's the 60 minutes story or uh, certainly uh, secondary stories about parent plus loans, uh, you know, I, I think we're, we're kind of in a territory where this is not going away. And I think it's something that's, that's going to grow as we try and, and tackle the very complex issues of uh, bringing people back online after they have been um, not making these payments, obviously, for some time. And I, it's only going to get worse, I think, with the extension of that. So I, I, my question is, and we have, a, you know, we have another freshman class that, that's attending college throughout this nation. So are there things that are being changed beyond just the order that's, that's already been offered when it comes to the entire student loan system. And I wanna go back to the parent plus loans a little bit because that has been one of, I think the most frustrating parts of this entire program in that what you have is uh, in, you know, it was just, just uh, a specific story it was just counted in the Wall Street Journal where a woman had two, two, uh, two children that went through Baylor University and she ends up with over $200,000 in student loans under her name, under a Parent PLUS loan and no ability to pay it back. And you just scratch your head, how could this possibly happen? I think part of it is that the universities continue to increase tuition, not really concerned about whether or not there is a collateral involved or whether or not it can be paid back and uh, it just becomes more and more complex. So it, although the thing that will not go away in our constituents, doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, are, are now completely engulfed in, how do I do this? How do I get my loan forgiveness in place? I mean, I, it, it, is the department though looking at, you know, moving forward, where are we now and, and how, can we, how can we deal with the issues before us when it comes to new students as well as the repayment plans? Well, so there was a lot there. Uh, in general, I agree with you. Look, it's, a, it's an unusual form of lending that we do with student loans in this country uh, where it is uh, not risk-based as most private sector lending is. Uh, and that does lead to some, some difficulties uh, down the road. Having said that, uh, you know, the student loan programs, as I understand it, and again, Congress has designed these programs and put them in place. Uh, it's meant to uh, strengthen this country by giving more access uh, on a more even-handed basis to higher education and what that means for improving people's prospects in life, their economic prospects and the like. Uh, however, you know, there are challenges in this program no doubt about it. There's challenges in ensuring uh, that loans are repaid uh, and making sure that's done on an even-handed basis. There's challenges in making sure that schools are providing value for the money. Uh, and I think we have an obligation to have effective oversight there. Uh, and, and I don't know if I'm answering your specific question or not, but if I'm not, feel free to reframe it. Uh, but that's, that's my reaction to, your, to, your, uh, to what you had to say. Yeah, I think Representative Castro kind of touched on it. You know, it, it borders on malfeasance, and I'm really worried about that part of this, that if there's predatory loaning, loans being made, if there are sequences within the program where, you know, there, there absolutely is, is some other type of motive involved, 
I, I'm really concerned about that because I think that's what the pause exposed. It exposed a system that quite honestly, I, I think many people are, are standing back and saying, listen, this is just not about loan forgiveness. This is about holding people accountable. Uh, and it's, it's very shady. I mean, this, this is starting to feel like, uh, you know, something that, that quite honestly deserves a lot more scrutiny than it has been receiving in the past. Well, we will do our best to hold people accountable, uh, you know, maybe schools in some instance, maybe services in some instance, maybe borrowers in some instance, uh, and we'll be happy to have more input from you as to how we can best do that uh, as we go. Uh, it's not an easy job, no question, but it's an important job and we'll, we'll try to do it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing. So by close of business on November 10th, 2021, preferably in Microsoft Word format, the materials that submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing only a member of the subcommittee on invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record by way of an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame. But please recognize that in the future, the link may no longer work. Pursuant to house rules and regulations, items for the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to edandlabor.hearings at mail.house.gov. Witness, um, again, I want to thank our witness uh, for his uh, dedication today, for his participation. We learned so much and we look forward to working with you. I told you this was an issue that was impacting America and I guess you found out from testifying here today. Members I guess I did, yes. <laughs> Members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for you and they will submit those in writing to you. We ask the witness to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, Witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The questions submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Dr. Murphy, for a closing statement. Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for uh holding this meeting and thank you, uh, Mr. Cordry for uh, participating today. Just wanna to make a few points as we close up. I appreciate uh, all the effort put into this today, but to be very honest with you, I'm a little disappointed in some of the responses uh, made by the witness. Um, there was a lot of deflection um, saying that that was for co quote Congress to decide, you know, on many issues like PSLF uh, where Congress already has decided uh, we had kind of a giant truck driven through the statute using authority that everyone knows was never intended for the purpose. You know, as I said in my open statement, the Department of Education and quite frankly yourself have been less than transparent, uh, to put it bluntly. I mean, that's just the fact. We hoped you would be more prepared to answer the questions that this committee uh, proposed. Uh, because largely they're the same questions we sent in our letters months ago and uh, didn't get very uh, valid responses. And so a pair of your lack of answers, uh, unfortunately, is somewhat par for the course for this administration. There seems to not be consistent measures of moving forward um, and answering specific questions for accountability. Uh, I want to reiterate, uh, as the chairwoman just said, that we, want, we expect answers to the questions given to you, ones that you said you were going to provide. Uh, thank you, but time regardless for your testimony. We look forward to the answers that this committee has asked you put back in writing to the members who submitted them. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I will yield back. Thank you. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making my closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Cordray, for your time and your work to support students and protect borrowers. 
Today, we discuss the major steps the Biden-Harris administration has taken to support federal student loan borrowers. In just nine months, the administration has provided 563,000 borrowers with 9.5 billion in relief they were legally entitled to to receive under the Higher Education Act. And as Mr. Cordray shared, the Education Department continues to develop stronger consumer protections for students and for taxpayers. While the department's progress has been encouraging, the approaching restart of student loan requirements and the longer term shift to next gen poses major challenges for FSA. Student borrowers and servicers need clear guidance to ensure the transition back to the repayment goes smoothly and the next gen fulfills the promise of a simpler, more consumer friendly student loan system. I look forward to our work ahead to ensure all student borrowers receive the support they need. Thank you again, Mr. Cardre, for your leadership and commitment to supporting students and their families. If there's no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.